Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay with expert level science. I'm Ken Hansen, an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I do all things light matter interaction, photons driving processes like uh, light to electricity or photomechanics or catalysis, whatever it is, light matter, I'm enjoying it, I'm interested in it. But more importantly, joining me today is Dr. Allison Wing. Allison, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, so I'm an assistant professor at FSU in the Department of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Science, and I'm an atmospheric scientist. So I study weather and climate um, with specific focus in tropical cyclones or hurricanes, other types of tropical convection and cloud systems and climate. And what do you usually teach? I teach undergraduate classes in atmospheric dynamics, which are, which is the study of the equations that govern how weather systems form and move. So it's lots of math and physics. And then I teach graduate classes about atmospheric convection. So basically thunderstorms, as well as extreme weather in a warming climate, where we discuss all the different types of extreme weather phenomena, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, heat waves, everything, and how it's being affected by climate change. Very cool. Equally important, what game are we starting with? We're starting with Mario Kart 64, bringing me back to middle school. <laughs> All right. So it has been a while. It's but been a while for it, sure. Don't worry, the, the, the muscular memory will come back very quickly. <laughs> it, it does for for all my guests. <laughs> Cuddle Puppy, welcome back to the stream. It's always a pleasure to have you. So we have predictions. We could do betting on whether you'll win your first one. <laughs> Do you, want, do you want that pressure? <laughs> I mean, I will do my best to win. I, uh, I, I'm pretty competitive. I mean, the disclaimer, as always, is mediocre game. Ball. Yeah. No pressure. The, the odds of me winning um, increase with the fewer questions I have to answer with while playing. Well, we'll let you warm up a little bit. <laughs> Luigi, that's fun. Yeah. So Scott Stagg played uh, Mario Kart 8, the new one for the Switch. Yeah. And one of the, my favorite questions from the stream so far is, which one of these characters would you rather have as a co-author? There we go. Um, I don't know. I don't really know that much about that. I mean, I, I used to play princess a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, but that's probably just because I was like a 10-year-old girl and liked <laughs> princess. Yeah, costume. you didn't want to be Donkey Kong. I yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Scott's answer was ultimately Luigi. Seems like a reliable person that would respond to emails. And yeah. Not, not try to take all the credit. He's solid. Yeah. It's not Mario. He's not, he's not, he doesn't have a huge ego. There we go. <laughs> Cuddle puppy. None of these characters have good academic credentials. <laughs> That's true. I, I would probably not hire them. But if they're a volunteer undergrad in lab. <laughs> yeah, you go. I don't know, you have to be careful even when someone's volunteering their time. Yeah. The cost is your time. No, that's very, very true. Well, there we go. I sent it backwards that time. Oh, what'd you do? Press down? I did. I think I just maybe pressed down before I fired it. I see. Rather I see. than kind of at the same time. Down and down and trigger. Yeah. Aw, oh, Toad, get out of here. Yeah, so I I didn't have a Nintendo system growing up, but I really liked playing it. Yeah. And a couple of my friends had them. My friend Nicole had Nintendo 64, and I, whenever I went over to her house, I always wanted to play it and to play Mario Kart. And she she was kind of like, well, no, I play it all the time, and let's play something else. I'm like, no, I want to play Mario Kart. <laughs> We're playing it now. Yeah. <laughs> I did not come over to hang out with you. Yeah, no, I, just to play. For, for those of you not familiar, I mean, this was this was high school for me when Nintendo 64 came out, and it was like between Mario Kart and Bond, the the first person. Oh shooter, yeah, yeah. Those were the key multiplayer's. You got together, split screen, four players at once. Yeah, I guess. Wait, what? What year? What year did N64 come out? That is a good question. Maybe it was high school for me too. I don't know. 1996. Okay, no, yeah, that was, I was in fifth grade then. So yeah, middle school was then that time when I was doing this a lot. Yeah, I never owned a Nintendo 64 either. It was, I had a Nintendo, which yeah. is why I have that collection back on the shelf there. Yeah. <laughs> Cuddle Puppy has a, a vote. Toad or Luigi are probably the best bets. Mario would want to be a leader. Peach is too absent-minded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it. Character judgments on Mario. 
Uh, that should probably be a standard question for our guests. That's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> should be part of our list. Oh, is this the one where like furry dogs pop mm -hmm. out at you? <laughs> yep. Let the hate run through you. <laughs> <laughs> you never forget those things. <laughs> You're like the worst one they like somehow land on top of you. Yep. You have to like bounce them off. I, I think it's the second lap is when they start popping up. Yeah. <laughs> Does it feel like it's coming back though? Definitely is. Definitely. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah. Speak of the devil. Uh, I'd, I'd say three or four of my 33 guests have played this game. Like I, it was it's such a, a touchstone game. in our Yeah, in like our it's youth. for our age group for sure. Yeah. I think it'd be fun to do a tournament with you guys. Oh, <laughs> like yeah. Oh, did that just my own shell that hit me? I think it was. Oh, the ice levels. Yeah, that's coming. So I don't know how familiar you are with... Uh, have you heard of speedrunning? You basically just beat video games as fast as you can. No. People have absolutely obliterated this game. Like they figured out how to jump off the map and jump across uh -oh. in like five like seconds. Like yep. Yeah. Yeah, so this game has been I mean over the last almost oh thirty years now. It's been or twenty five has been optimized. Nice. <laughs> is Toad wearing a hat or is that just his head? I think that's the age-old question. <laughs> I think that is one that we will not answer here. <laughs> Allison, what's your vote? Hat I think or it, head? It's his head, I think. I mean, is it a mushroom? Is 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 Toad a fungi? Oh, well, maybe he's just like living under a mushroom. <laughs> cuddle puppy, narc bragging incoming. No, cuddle puppy beat me. <laughs> I challenge you to beat me in narc. I will continue until you take my record away from. Me. All right, you settled in. All First right. place on two races in a row. There we go. I mean, you're you're on a roll. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions for Allison Wing, she's happy to talk uh, tropical cyclones, atmospheric sciences, meteorology, extreme weather, climate change, whatever you have questions about, feel free to throw it in, in chat, and, and we'll be happy to answer them. Or ask whatever. We are happy to discuss everything. We, we always manage to go on some kind of tangent. <laughs> So last time with Mike Shatruck, it was the diamond industry being a scam, which is kind of fun. It wasn't. <laughs> Seeing if I can get an emulator copy. Cuddle Puppy, are you on Discord? If so, you should message me on Discord and I'll, sh I'll point you in the right direction. What's interesting is, so we're running this on an emulator. Mm -hmm. And so what they've done, they've, they're really clever, is they recreated the hardware in silico. So this is running like actual Nintendo 64, so all the timing is right, because if you speed run, you get really serious about the rules, and the, mm -hmm. the, the rates and everything. But So the emulator itself isn't illegal, but the ROMs that you run at it technically are unless you own the game. And so as long as you have owned the game, then it's okay. So it's kind of underground, but nobody's actually enforcing rules on it. Yeah. So. First time chat from Tropical Geek. Tropical Geek, welcome to the stream. Is the tendency to an uh, to an increased number of hurricanes a factual thing? What is the worst case scenario in the next 40 years? So more hurricanes like under climate change, under global warming. So no, actually, we we do expect a aspects of hurricanes to get worse um, with global warming. So we expect hurricanes to get stronger to have more rainfall associated with them, but we don't necessarily expect there to be more hurricanes. Um, that's something that we don't really have confidence in right now in terms of the number of hurricanes and how that's gonna change in a warming climate. Um, some of our models say that it'll increase, some will say that it will decrease. Uh, we also don't have a good theory for what controls the number of hurricanes in a given climate. That's actually something that my research um, is, try is trying to improve our knowledge on. Um, and so because we don't kind of have a theoretical expectation and the models say different things, we have sort of low confidence in what the number of hurricanes will do. But as I said, for hurricane intensity, so the strength of the wind speeds and rainfall, there both are theoretical expectations from basic physical theory 
as well as our models, as well as observations, agree that hurricanes are getting stronger and wetter and will continue to. I mean, so if you had to simplify those models, like you have variables like total energy in the atmosphere plus energy distribution, I mean, so, so is there... So, so the one that says frequency might increase, what variable is causing that? So all of these models are all models that solve the basic equations of motion that govern how weather works, basically. So it's it's the laws of physics. It's essentially Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got lots of different forces that contribute to that. Um, pressure gradient force, Coriolis, all that kind of stuff. The rotation of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you solve those equations and, you know, divide the Earth up into lots of different grid points, solve those equations at every grid point at every time for many, many years. But, you know, there's different ways you can kind of do the solving, different ways you can approximate um, some of the other processes going on. So how to represent, you know, rainfall and, you know, motion, small scale motions and thunderstorms, how to represent clouds. And so different models do those things differently and can get different answers. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what's your control data set for those models then? You look at previous hurricanes and you apply the model to them and see if it, it works out? So they're really the same type of models that we use for normal weather forecasting, except they're doing a climate prediction instead. Um, and they are validated against, you know, observed data of hurricanes as well as all other different types of weather. Mm -hmm. And our models, you know, they're pretty good for forecasting weather. For hurricanes on climate time scales, they're not great, they're getting better. The challenge is that in order to run a model to look at future climate project projections, we need to run it for hundreds of years. Um, and that means that we have to use a pretty coarse grid spacing. So, you know, one a grid box every one or two degrees of latitude, 100, 200 kilometers. I see. Um, and so that means that things like hurricanes are not- oh, <laughs> wrecked, <dying. totally> wrecked. <laughs> Uh, so that means that things that like hurricanes that occur on somewhat smaller scales are not simulated perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the challenge um, with those particular types of models. But, you know, they're always getting better, um, but there's definitely still work we can do to improve them. Scuzzbot is impressed. Answering questions while getting first place. Yes. Not just once, many times. <laughs> <laughs> Allison's tearing it up. She said before the stream, she's very competitive, so yeah. the pressure is on. <laughs> I know. Because <laughs> your colleagues just will not respect you in the morning. They definitely <laughs> you will play not. play Mario Kart. Uh, that's part of the fun of it, though. Just have to avoid, like, hitting the bananas that I laid. Oh, there's another one someone just threw. Any insights from the Maria hurricane? So Hurricane Maria um, was a really powerful hurricane that hit a couple of years ago, really devastated um, Puerto Rico. You know, it's, you know, adds to kind of a string of intense hurricanes that have affected the United States in, in recent years, um, kind of showing, you know, what we have to worry about, you know, with, you know, the risk of more intense hurricanes in the future. Um, and every hurricane, you know, as a scientist, you know, I, I wish all the hurricanes would be super intense and powerful, but stay out in the middle of the ocean and affect <laughs> no one. And so then we could study them and learn from them, yeah. but not have to deal with all the devastation. But um, yeah, I mean, every hurricane, you know, we do use the data from it to try to learn more and um, improve our models, improve our understanding, and ultimately, you know, to be able to give better forecasts and more warning and um, allow people to prepare better. I mean, that's an interesting interesting philosophical qualm that I hadn't thought about for, before. Because, like, as a chemist, I, I'm funded by the Department of Defense. And what I do could inadvertently be used to kill someone. Yeah. You're in a very different realm of, like, you need that data, but the stuff you study causes a lot of damage. Yeah. That's, that... But, I mean, I think that's one of the things that certainly motivates me and, and many, you know, meteorologists and climate scientists to study what we study is that it has such a direct you know, impact on people. And um, I mean, you know, I'm fascinated by it scientifically, but also, you know, humbled by, you know, the power that, you know, our world nature can create. Um, and so it's kind of that dual sort of thing, the scientific curiosity about it, as well as the impact to people that, you know, motivates me and many other scientists to try to understand these phenomena better. 
So I'm going to throw up one of these predictions before we accidentally answer it. And it is... That one right there. <laughs> so I think that's a nice segue into... Oh, nice. <laughs> That'll be a good one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, Ask a Scientist Gaming. We use our predictions not for gaming, well, sometimes for gaming, but also for scientific predictions and questions and questions about our guest. And so uh, if you guys have your standard internet units ready, get ready to bet them. If you're not following, click the follow button. It gives you points. You can spend them on things on this channel. They're not particularly useful. We call them standard internet units because they are kind of useless. Uh, but you can do things like buy a factoid or request we take a drink or unlock an emote. And so if you're not following, click follow. If you are following, bet your money on these or your, your standard internet units on this prediction that's showing up now. Um, Uh-oh, <laughs> something went wrong with that. Arrow versus zero. I don't know why that, like, crapped out on me. Predictions freezing. Do you guys see a prediction or did that not show up? Meanwhile, I've been awarded the gold cup. Congratulations. Did you win every race? <laughs> I did. Holy cow. Now 100 CC? Yeah. This is setting a possibly unsustainable precedent. <laughs> Push it to limit. All right. I, something's going crazy on my... He says they don't understand the question. I It's not even showing up on my menu. I don't know. Something Twitch is freaking out right now. So I can't see the prediction and it's not doing anything on my screen. So let me troubleshoot this. That's and then good. We will... Alright. Sorry, I'm going to end this guy. Delete and return points. I'm going to start Sorry. it again because it did something weird here. So you moved up to... Well, I'm saying I decided to say I'm 50, but I'm going to... For now, because I think the flower cup is harder than the mushroom cup. All right. Now I can see the prediction, ladies and gentlemen. All right. The question is, Dr. Allison Wing experienced her first hurricane at age 5 years old or at 30 years old? And there is really no way you can know this. <laughs> I mean, you could extrapolate based on what you've seen of uh, Alice so far. But the question is, when did she experience her first hurricane? Five years old or at 30 years old? So I apologize if you already put your bet in there. Put it in there again because I restarted the question again. Um, this, this is a fun one because, like, you could go either way with this. Cause there's... There's one extreme where you experienced it young and that started your career, or another one where you were just interested in it and you happened to not experience it until later. Like the mechanic in town drives the worst car kind of thing, but I'd throw your best guesses in there right now. If you're not following, click the follow button, make your predictions with your 300 standard internet units. While we're waiting, I won't add anything more it's at risk of giving it away. What are we drinking tonight? Got some hard cider. For those, that, those of you that are interested, we are starting with Schilling's London Dry Hard Cider. 6.5% alcohol. That's pretty high for a cider, isn't it? <laughs> like a beer. Slightly strong beer, maybe. <laughs> Scott's bot would just redeem to take a drink. So, if you can pause. How do we pause? A uh, red button in the center. Okay. All right. Scuzzbot, thank you for stopping by. Cheers. Cheers, Allison. Thank you for joining me. I, I sent a cold email to Allison saying, hey, do you want to play video games and talk science? And she said yes. <laughs> so she's really the crazy one here. <laughs> How much do you charge for phone a friend to weather woman services? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's... Uh, but you can uh, go to the National Weather Service for free. <laughs> All right, Allison, when was your first hurricane? So I experienced my first hurricane when I was five years old. So I want to I wanna envision this as like a, a Helen Hunt in the movie Twister scenario <laughs> where it changed your life forever. Yeah. And set your career path. It did, kind of. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I was, I was five years old. I was on vacation. So I was on vacation in Cape Cod, Massachusetts with my family. I'm from New York originally grew up in the Northeast, lived in the Northeast my whole life um, before moving to Florida for this job. Um, so we were on vacation in Cape Cod and, you know, rented a beach house. 
and Hurricane Bob um, actually hit while we were there. We had to evacuate our beach house, you know, go to a shelter. I think it was like, you know, high, local, high, like local school gymnasium, something like that. Um, I found it really exciting. You know, it was windy and rainy. After we left, you know, there was some water on the roads driving back to our beach house. L luckily, there wasn't too much damage right where we were. But Hurricane Bob was a, a really bad hurricane for other parts of New England, a little bit further west down the Cape in Buzzards Bay and Rhode Island, where it actually made landfall. Um, the name was retired because of all the damage. And so that, oh, oh. no, that experience kind of was the first event that kind of piqued my interest in weather, in meteorology, and, and in hurricanes specifically. I think it's, it's it's sort of common amongst meteorologists to have this origin story, if mm -hmm. you will, like some impactful extreme weather event um, at a young age that kind of drew their interest. So, you know, after that, I always was interested in weather. Um, when I was in middle school, you know, I watched the weather channel every day and kept my own like notebook with weather forecasts and things like that um and then you know eventually you know went to school for for meteorology and atmospheric science and ended up studying hurricanes so i mean I, it's not that like hurricane bob happened and then i was like dreamed of being a meteorologist but that was the event that definitely yeah. stands out in my memory i mean it's fun a lot of us scientists i mean any career basically you have certain moments that cumulatively you can pinpoint this pushed me further this pushed me further then i landed here tropical geek bob's your uncle lol aussie <laughs> joke no <laughs> that's, that's a dad joke i should bring the band hammer down on you tropical geek <laughs> that's pretty spectacular uh so five years old so i didn't experience my first hurricane until i moved here yeah and it was so it was I don't remember what my first one was. So I started here in 2013. Okay, so, so probably Kermine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In 2016. Yep. Uh, was there one before? That was, that was the first one that made like a direct impact in yeah. a long time. Yeah. My, my colleagues here kind of make fun of me because when I was interviewing here, which was an earlier in 2016, I was like, well, you know, I study hurricanes, but I don't really want to be affected by them. Like, do you, is it bad here in Tallahassee? Do you get hit a lot? And they're like, no, it's fine. We never get hit by hurricanes. The last one was like in the eighties. And I was like, okay. And then I decide to come here immediately. Hurricane Hermine hits the next year is Irma. The next year is Michael. And so they are like, it's your fault. You arrived and the hurricanes have returned to Tallahassee. Is that part of I'm your model? I'm in a tractor. Is that Allison waiting yeah, tractor the, to change the vector what's map? The, what are the key predictors in the regression model for Tallahassee hurricane landfalls? Time since I arrived at FSU. Oh, uh, that is a testable hypothesis. Yeah, it is. <laughs> we, can, we can go that route. Yeah. That's really fun. <laughs> Thus, the observation on increase in number. <laughs> there you go. Climate change or Alice, which is a more influential force. Put that as our next prediction. That's fun. So, so somebody got four people got a five point six to one payout on that question. Good job. Th those that bet thirty years old were very confident in their bet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean reasons. that would that would have been like right when I arrived in Tallahassee, basically, which. You know, and statistically, you're much more likely to be hit by a hurricane here in Florida than in, you know, New York, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. So one might have thought that that would have been the correct answer. But we, I don't know, we got hit by a few. I remember also Hurricane Floyd in like 2000, I think. It, we had just a lot of rain from it, but school did close because of all the rain in New York. Mm -hmm. So I guess, so I grew up in Minnesota, so no okay. hurricanes for us, obviously, but tornadoes were a serious thing. And you yeah. had all the tornado shelter drills. We drew, we grew up in a trailer house, so it was like, you are screwed oh, that's, unless you get yeah, to like the you school. You need a shelter. Yep. But uh, it's going to lead me to a question that, you know, classifications in science matter, right? Pluto's no longer a planet because of the rules associated with it. And I also learned that atmospheric levels are defined by temperature and not composition. But anyway, mm. the, where I'm going with this is there's a lot of cyclic wind systems there's tornadoes there's hurricanes there's cyclones there's typhoons lots of so, spinning so, things yeah what what is the the classification scheme that differentiates those uh like why they're one's called a yeah, tornado yeah, yeah. versus what? a hurricane versus something else oh, nice mm -hmm. um so it's based partially on the scale of the phenomena so what size they are what time scale they 
occur over and the fundamental oh man this first one i lost the fundamental like driving mechanism so in general we do have a lot of spinning weather systems and mm -hmm. that's because the earth is spinning um and so the spin in the atmosphere imparts onto weather systems but um hurricanes and tropical cyclones so tropical cyclone is the general term um for the phenomena but we call them hurricanes in the atlantic typhoons in the pacific it's all the same thing. Um, those terms are kind of interchangeable. So what's the origin of the, what? that's just the arbitrary? Name? Yeah. Um, well, so hurricane comes from, I think it was um, Huracan, which is the Mayan god of wind. Okay. Um, so the Mayans and other, you know, ancient cultures you knew about these systems. And the really creepy thing is their symbol for that wind god is literally what a look a hurricane looks like <laughs> from a satellite. Like, how did they know? How could yeah. they possibly know yeah. it had that like spiral, you know, arm structure to it? That's I'm not sure the etymology of the word typhoon. Hmm. Um, but those systems, so they're cyclones because they're low pressure systems um, that spin. They spin counterclockwise. The winds are counterclockwise at the surface in the northern hemisphere, other direction in the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And they get their energy from um, the ocean. So from fluxes of energy from the ocean to the atmosphere as water evaporates, that transfers energy in the atmosphere. Versus um, extra tropical cyclones, um, which occur in the mid latitudes, like your kind of winter storms, those get their energy from back temperature gradients in the atmosphere. So the fact that the North Pole is colder than the equator. So it's different sources of energy and that leads us to classify them differently. Tornadoes, they are much, much smaller scale phenomena that's embedded within a single thunderstorm system. Um, and they get their rotation from their parent thunderstorm basically, rather than developing it on their own. So they all have different, you know, formation mechanisms and physics behind them and then because of that different um, scales and different dynamics and different ways that they operate. And uh, dust storm is the smallest version of that? Dust the devil, dust yeah. Devil. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, Tropical Geek has a comment. Hurricane is a Teano word? I think that's right. Which means right. wind center? That's fun. We have a hello tropical expert. Thank you for the, the stream. Clarification. Mid 16th century from the Spanish hurricane, probably from Tiano Huracan, God of the Storm. There you go. That's really fun. Real time fact check. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> awesome. <that> coming. <laughs> awesome. Oh, uh, no. Well, again, welcome to the, the stream, Tropical Geek. Pleasure to have you here. All right. Yeah, we also have our moment of euphoria, Carl Sagan emote, if you learn something new. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Not probably. The probably is from Google. I state it's factual. That's fair. <laughs> All right. Going back to some questions. Cuddle Puppy wants to know, I heard the North Atlantic current might be disrupted by climate change. Is climate change? Is there any new evidence to that? So the ocean current. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so there's lots of different currents in the ocean. There's, you know, the Gulf Stream and other Western boundary currents. And those are driven primarily um, by the shape of our, you know, ocean basins and winds. And so those aren't going away as long as the winds blow and the earth rotates, we'll still have the Gulf Stream. Um, but there's also what's known as the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And so this is a, a deep circulation in the ocean where deep water forms, you know, very dense, cold, salty water in the North Atlantic sinks down and that flows equatorward and, you know, rises up elsewhere in the ocean and that is really slow it takes like thousands of years to overturn and the strength of that is affected by the density of the ocean water so how cold is it how salty is it and those are things that could change uh, because of climate change you know there's ideas that if all the glaciers melt you know that puts a lot of fresh water into the ocean which would reduce its salinity and make it harder maybe to form this deep water um but i think the danger of it shutting down is is pretty low but certainly the circulation can change um could change because of of climate change but that was i think i think that was the premise of the day after tomorrow or something like that where they that <laughs> yeah. circulation would shut down and then like 
all this air would be cold air would be brought down from the stratosphere. Anyway, yeah, it's yeah completely no, it wrong. Created like a vacuum, and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you're saying that movie was unrealistic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a really unrealistic one. I mean, if so, the air in the stratosphere. I mean, that's you know up above where airplanes fly and where the ozone layer is. It is very very cold up there. But if you take that air and bring it to the surface. Um, it would compress and be really, really hot, actually. So if we brought that stratosphere air down here, we would have the opposite of the situation a day after tomorrow. C Cuddle Puppy insists day after tomorrow is a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it. All right. Um, Homegirl Homegirl asks, any places you would love to visit to explore their weather patterns in person? Oh, that's a good question. So, sorry, got to get the start here. That didn't oh, go well. I like bounced off of Bowser. Bowser. Yeah. Stupid Bowser. It's like a wall. Um, yeah, so I mean, my research that I do, I mostly do modeling. Um, so I use computer models to study hurricanes and other west weather systems. But I have had the opportunity to participate in a few field campaigns where I've gotten to go out and collect my own data. And the nice thing about studying, you know, hurricanes and tropical clouds is you get to go to the tropics to you'd collect data on them. So I spent some time, I twice have gone to Barbados um, to collect data on tropical clouds and storms. And I would love to go back to Barbados. That was awesome. Um, I also went to Costa Rica, so I, other tropical islands, I'm down for that, you know, whenever anyone wants to send me to a tropical island. <laughs> I mean, so what, what data set are you, it's not in-person data, right? You're, like, how are you collecting that data? Where does that come Where from? that, for like, when we, I went to Barbados and Costa yeah, Rica? Yeah, yeah, so those were actually aircraft campaigns where we would fly around um, in different cloud systems, around um, cloud systems, in them and collect data. So there's all sorts of instruments on the aircraft itself so that you can just, you know, measure the temperature and the humidity and the winds just, you know, at flight level. And then there's lots of other instrumentation strapped on. So, you know, radars to measure rain and motion in the atmosphere and cloud amount. Um, there's also, we can drop drop suns out of airplanes. So it's, it's like a weather balloon, but it goes down instead of up. Mm. Um, and as it falls, you know, down to the surface, you know, with a little parachute, collects temp data on the temperature, the humidity, the pressure, the winds. And that's crucial data. I mean, this is what like the hurricane hunters, you know, do when they fly around through hurricanes, they collect this data, which goes into our forecast models and is, is used for prediction. But we collect that type of data for research as well. And so that's the stuff that, yeah, I was doing there. I've never flown through a hurricane. Um, I flew through a weather system that later became a hurricane. It wasn't a hurricane yet when I flew through it. It was just a disturbance, but later became Hurricane Evo in the East Pacific Ocean in August of 2019, I think. Um, but I would love to fly through a hurricane itself one day. Yeah, I've seen some fun presentation by like atmospheric chemists because they do like mass spec sampling from those same airplanes. And, like, okay, yeah. And compositionally find, you know, sulfur or some nucleating agents or... Yeah, I you mean, can do stuff with like um, aerosols and um, isotopes and all sorts of microphysics measurements, cloud droplet concentrations, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like these aircraft that are used, like, I mean, so there's a variety of different ones that different agencies have, have all sorts of, you know, advanced instruments strapped on them. Um, it's really awesome what kind of data they can collect. <laughs> Tropical Geek actually preempted your question. Do you go on airplanes to get data? I have a friend that does that too. So oh, yes, cool. the answer is yes. And she'd be happy to do it again. Cuddle Puppy is our local troll. What about the tropical island that Tom Hanks was trapped on for seven years when his plane crashed? <laughs> <laughs> do we do we know where that island is? Is it's there like, rough like the idea? South Pacific or something, I think? I have no someone idea. Very, somewhere it's very isolated. Uh, someone with Google Foo. Tropical Geek, I'm looking at you. <laughs> someone correct us where the... Uh, where the Tom Hanks. What was the name of the castaway? That's yeah. the name of the movie. All right, a follow up on that. <clears throat> Homegirl, Homegirl wants to know if given the opportunity, would you go to space? That's a fun question. So, when I was in fifth grade, one of my career goals was actually to be an astronaut. Um, I think I would love to go to outer space, but I would also be really afraid 
mostly I think to do all the training ahead of time, um, which is also what scares me about flying through hurricanes. Like they like basically like it's even more involved to become an astronaut, of course, but they like strap you in an airplane seat basically and dump you in a pool and you have to like escape and fly out, swim out. And I don't know, I'm, I am incapable of opening my eyes underwater and I'd be really afraid just to do that training, probably more afraid than the flight itself. So I mean, the I mean, stress of takeoff alone. Yeah. Like, I cannot imagine. And, like, uh, yeah. I mean, you're sitting on top of a bomb, basically, <laughs> yeah, exactly. to get into outer space, it's, right? It's it's not, I mean, it's safe-ish, but it's still pretty terrifying. I, I couldn't imagine that. <clears throat> but it would be really cool. I mean, and I do, like, typically astronauts are, if you either are, like, a fighter pilot or you're a a scientist with an advanced degree. So I have, you know, one of those qualifications. <laughs> Oh, we have an answer on uh, Castaway. Castaway Island is an island of the Mamanaku... Mon I, 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 Mon Monoriki? Right oh, there. Mamanuka group. Ma 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 Monica. Well, Monica uh, Fiji, in Fiji, anyway. It's inhabited. I was right, South Pacific. Tourist resort on the west side. See, so he just had to search the west side and he would have been fine. <laughs> 70 hectares. And more fact to it on it. Disregard the first one. Monoriki. All right. <laughs> yes, if Tom Hanks was a castaway island, he deserved to be stuck for not walking to the tourist resort. I agree. He could have been drinking coconuts. All right. Questions from a first time chatter. PH blank. Welcome to the stream. PH, nice science name. We like it. Uh, thoughts on Allison being the first name retired from a, a from a storm that didn't become a hurricane. Yeah, Tropical Storm Allison, I think, was it 2000-ish? Mm -hmm. um, prior to Hurricane Harvey, um, Allison was the sort of, you know, storm that w everything was compared to in terms of rainfall in Texas and the Houston area. I think that goes to show that, you know, you don't need to have strong winds to have a lot of damage from a, a tropical cyclone, a tropical storm, or a hurricane. And in fact, you know, it's the water related hazards, rainfall and storm surge and the flooding associated with them that actually caused the most deaths, not the winds. And so I think it's a reminder that, you know, the wind speed isn't everything and you need to pay attention to the water related hazards as well. I mean, that's an interesting whenever I hear like, this is the biggest hurricane ever. There are different metrics. There's like a total amount of water, there's total velocity, there's radius. Mm -hmm. And those aren't necessary. are they related intrinsically or? Some of them are related. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, for example, like typically, um, yeah, you know, a stronger storm will have more, you know, integrated kinetic energy associated with it. but. It also depends on the size of the storm mm -hmm. and you can have storms that are the same intensity in terms of the strength of the wind speeds, but very different sizes in terms of the, you know, how, what large an area those winds are spread out over. And it's, that's very important for the impacts, especially when you're talking about things like rainfall um, or flooding from storm surge, which is where the hurricane winds, you know, push ocean water up against the coastline. A bigger storm will give you more storm surge because it's, those winds are, you know, pushing the water over a larger area um you know building it up along the coastline so and it's size is size is something that we don't have a great understanding of um huh. and you know there's probably even less attention put into researching it than other aspects of hurricanes but it makes a big difference for impacts for sure and, and size you're talking like radius or diameter, yeah the, the, the like perimeter? the diameter yeah. so and you can do it based on various metrics like you know the outer size of the storm where the winds would go to zero or, you know, how how far from the center of the storm do you go out to get winds of, you know, 12 knots or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can have quite a range of different sizes. All right. You want to keep playing or you want to switch up games? It is totally up to you when you want to do. Let's keep going. We're, we're 40 minutes in. OK, Go I gotta get cups. to I gotta get to Rainbow Road at least. So let's finish the cups here, and then All we right. can move on to something else. Sounds good. <clears throat> All right, Arthur of Hyrule wants to know: Is it safe to fly through a hurricane? Um, with the yeah, appropriately <laughs> trained flight crew, generally yes. I mean, again, I personally haven't flown through a hurricane, but talking to people who have, it's um, you just have to you know fly through it at the appropriate 
um, altitude, basically. You don't want to fly through it really close to the surface. So the hurricane hunters from, you know, the Air Force and NOAA, they fly through um, at around 10,000 feet, um, five to 10,000 feet. They don't really go any lower than that. That's when it's dangerous. And they, they fly through them in planes powered by propellers. So C-130s and WP-3s, um, because I think like those different, they were, they're able to kind of control the engine speed and the propeller speed, like with more fine tuning, like they can respond more quickly to like the, you know, updrafts and downdrafts versus jet engines. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, they're highly trained pilots to do this, but you know, you have, you can have some bad turbulence in the eye wall, which is like that ring of like really intense thunderstorms, you know, near the center of the hurricane where the strongest winds are. But um, otherwise, you know, you can get worse turbulence in just like commercial flights and regular thunderstorms. So it's, you know, there is danger to it, but um, they are, and they're very cautious, especially these days, like they're, you know, they don't put the plane or the crew at risk. Um, so it's it's definitely doable. <laughs> it's safe-ish. <laughs> safe-ish, yeah. No, no, no I mean my safe, so. my PhD advisor, like he said, like you know, I've literally he's had worse turbulence on like American Airlines coming into Boston, you know, to land than flying through hurricanes. So. All right, Gohaku wants to know: Can you explain what cloud seeding is? I heard China's using the technology to create clear skies. So cloud seeding, the idea behind that is, it, so clouds are, you know, little droplets of liquid water suspended in the atmosphere. And in order to get that water to condense, you know, from water vapor to condense into liquid water, you typically need to have some sort of little particle for the water to condense onto, like a piece of dust um, or like an aerosol, um, sulfate aerosol, sea salt, sometimes an insect, something like that. And so the idea with cloud seeding is that you artificially put these little particles of some sort in the atmosphere and it gives cloud something to form onto. Um, and that can make more clouds. It can make clouds that have different amounts of liquid water in them to make it more likely that they rain. And if you make clouds in one place, then maybe it's less likely that you have clouds someplace else. So it definitely, it, it's been used, you know, here in the U.S. as well um, for, you know, trying to like make it rain for agriculture and things like that. I think the thing with it is that it definitely works in that it changes the clouds and it changes the precipitation, but it's hard to control, um, you know, again, like maybe you make it rain more here, but then less someplace else. And then that's problematic or cloudier here, clearer there. And it's, yeah, it's difficult to predict exactly what direction things go once you do that cloud seeding. But yeah, it's part of these, you know, weather modification efforts, which, you know, many countries have been doing both purposefully and unpurposefully for a long time. So do you guys use the word nucleation? Yes. Okay, so it's the same. That's what we teach in chemistry, like phase changes and yep. crystal growth. And So those little particles and things I was saying, they're condensation nuclei. Yep, so nucleation sites, yep. which is very cool. All right, um, Arash Math wants to know, how much of your job is method development and how much of it is using methods on data which others have developed? Uh, it's both, it's both. I mean, I've developed, you know, analysis methodologies and tools to use and have applied them to both data that I've generated as well as data that other people have generated. And then other people have taken my analysis methods and applied them to their data and other data. Um, so I would say it's both. And, you know, I run my own model simulations and generate data, but I also make use of simulations that other people have done, you know, observations taken by other people, you know, I make use of satellite observations, um, things like that, where, you know, it's, you know, no one person can go out and take satellite measurements, right? That's a big collective effort by the scientific community and agencies that fund them. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a mixture of things. All right, so before we get this next question, one of my standard questions that I really love because I've watched a lot of movies. Um, <laughs> so we talk about this with pretty much every guest. Uh, this, the question is, what movie or TV show gets your discipline right and which ones get it wrong? And so we already talked about Day After Tomorrow being ridiculous. Very wrong, very wrong. <laughs> Other wrong, the list is probably pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> 
but one that actually is pretty good surprisingly twister is is not that bad that's awesome um i'm really happy to hear that actually. and it's a great movie that's i love i love twister i love twister no question i mean the whole like cows going around multiple times that's maybe not realistic but the um instrument that they had in that movie dorothy you know with all those little, yeah, the little doohickeys that would that was a real thing that was a real you know instrument that people you know scientists were using to try to study you know tornadoes and it was the movie was kind of based on this field campaign called the vortex field campaign it stands for verification of the origins of rotation and tornado something or other mm -hmm. and yeah i mean that was part of it and so the the scientific basis behind that was was pretty legitimate <laughs> the tornado growling at you maybe not so yeah, much yeah <laughs> the sound effects that. they overflew that but yeah. no that's that that is one of my guilty pre pleasure like action movies <laughs> like uh, yeah it's it's got enough absurdity but fun I, yeah. yeah yeah so i mean day after tomorrow is terrible that's uh, terrible sharknado oh my god <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> uh, what else is there I mean, there's I'm trying to think what other yeah disaster related movies. I mean, this is not like a weather one, but there was one like about I think it's called like San Andreas or something where like the whole San Andreas fault oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, erupts and there's like then a that triggers a tsunami or something. That's yeah, like it's the disaster porn genre that existed. Yeah. Like it was really popular like 20, 2005 to 2015. Yeah. Like the 2012 movie A Day After Tomorrow. And <laughs> just absurdity. They yeah. did not consult people for those. 2012. Yeah, you're exactly right, Cuddle Puppy. I like in all, there's, all these movies, they, they, there's a scientist in like some basement lab or something somewhere that discovers something, something and then like, <laughs> you know, tells yeah. the people yeah. in charge and is routinely ignored. And yeah. that's... Oh man, did realistic. you watch the, the recent Netflix one? The what is it called? Yeah. I knew the name of this. With Leonardo DiCaprio. Yes. Yeah, I forget the name. I did watch it. That's depressing, isn't it? It is depressing. Like, I didn't really like that movie. I mean, I just didn't find it entertaining. Yeah. Like like not even I mean I mean it was definitely were things about it that rang true, but I just didn't think it was uh, funny at all. Yeah, well what I was wondering while I watched it, don't look up. Don't look up. Thank you, go. cuddle puppy. Uh, is like, is my discomfort with that movie because I this hits too close to home, or yeah. is it actually a bad movie? And I don't know. I, it might have been too self righteous or too. I don't know. I mean, it's probably a little bit of both. But I, yeah, I just even absent the part of it, yeah, hitting a little close to home. I just, I just didn't think it was entertaining. Yeah. No, that's fair. It also makes you think how we'd actually cope with something like that. The answer yeah. is poorly. Yeah, probably about as well as in that movie. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends who's president at the time. Yeah. Whether you're Puerto Rican or not. Yeah. yeah. All right, Homegirl, Homegirl wants to know, in a follow-up to that discussion, uh, do you think you'd enjoy being a consultant advisor for uh, End of Days slash Weather movie? Oh, I don't know. It could be kind of fun. Might be a lot of pressure to get it right and then like inevitably you no, know they're still <laughs> yeah not gonna really do things correctly uh i mean and they can take or leave whatever they want right for exactly value, and then like, your name's attached to it yeah i don't know i i knew a guy that uh consulted for breaking bad oh and wow. they, they, they they stayed pretty true to the science but they cut out steps to not give away making math obviously yeah but, but I, I, he seemed to enjoy it because that, I guess that was lower stakes in terms yeah. of what they were doing. But um, yeah, I can see the pressure with that. So I did a, I did a shoot for a Discovery Channel show called uh, Strange Evidence. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm stuck in the corner. <laughs> Interstellar, yeah, they had consultants. <laughs> but I did a shoot for this show called Strange Evidence, and what they basically do is they they look at mysterious YouTube videos or video clips, and then like have you know, the, the, the mystic answer, and then they'll have a scientist essentially debunk it, say this is what it is. But they cut it together in such a way that anything I said 
It was like there was one scene where it was it was like there was yellow spheres washing up on a shore. And I was like, those are balls of wax They're from <laughs> something that washed up on the shore. It's clearly some hydrocarbon of some kind. But they're like, could it be TNT? And I'd say something like, well, TNT has a yellow color. And when they cut it together, they were like, Dr. Hansen thinks it's TNT. <laughs> I'm like, oh, You're like, that's I'm, not quite what I, I did. I, I, all right. Take take that for what it's worth. So, yeah, that's that's the risk with any of those shoots is they can take what they want from them. Yeah. But... Yeah, apparently Interstellar's modeling of like black holes and those behaviors, that was really accurate. They talked to physicists about that. That's kind of fun. Or was it James Cameron that like he shot Titanic because he wanted to go deep sea diving? Yeah. <laughs> <For> respect. <laughs> that did not go well. So. Homegirl, homegirl wants to know, have you ever said I told you so when someone didn't believe your weather forecast? Um, I mean, probably to my family, not to like the public. <laughs> <laughs> Just go on TV and mic drop. <laughs> like, here's your hurricane. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's interesting. Is your family skeptical of your... N no, but, you know... Sometimes. They'll, they will always ask me, you know, what's the weather going to be like this day, that day? What's this hurricane going to do? Is it going to snow, etc.? And... Sometimes they don't believe what I say, but most of the time they do value my advice and feedback and forecasts. And it's a lot of pressure though. I mean, I'm glad I'm not a forecaster because yeah. people, it, the opposite usually what is what happens. Like when your forecast is, you know, just the slightest bit incorrect, mm -hmm. they, everyone will let you hear it. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of pressure. Oh my God, how do I get up here? <laughs> There we go. Um, so, yeah, research is typically lower immediate stakes. Um, there we go. Go on track. Guys, my gameplay is deteriorating <laughs> here. Looking, the cider is kicking in. It totally is. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's engaging conversation. <laughs> That's what makes this fun. <laughs> I can't on the road. <laughs> oh, no pressure. Uh, and okay. consulting for a movie. I don't think I've ever been asked that. I mean, I do a lot of, you know, I speak to the press frequently and I've I've consulted on some museum exhibits. Oh, that's fun. Um, but yeah, but that, I mean, it's like, you know, the curators, you know, they want to get the science right like it's it, the me getting the message across is their point not entertainment per se yeah um so that's a little bit different than a movie or tv show but it's definitely a balance between those variables yeah I mean, so in terms of weather forecasting how should i interpret so if there's a 30 percent chance of rain in the morning yeah did, that doesn't reflect the magnitude like how do no. i interpret that number that's just like will raindrops fall so that's like yeah the precipitation probabilities are basically no one knows how to interpret them often not a, not even other meteorologists but it means that you know for a, a specific area um over that specific time period there's you know the 30 percent chance that there'll be rain somewhere in that region in that time window um so you couldn't try to interpret it as like a if you think about you know tallahassee here in the summer you know we have like a 30 percent chance of rain every day in the summer basically yeah and that's because um you know there's gonna be scattered thunderstorms around and you know they're gonna cover approximately 30 percent of the area and so your odds of getting hit by one are around that but it has nothing to do with the intensity of the rain um or you know yeah how much you're gonna get um, and so, yeah, sometimes people say like, oh yeah, it, it, it rained, but there was only a 30% chance. And it's like, well, okay. So, you know, that was saying, you know, three out of 10 chances of getting it right. So it rained, then I guess it was one of those three out of those 10 times. So yeah, it's, I would interpret it as again, a likelihood, like it's, it might rain. It might yeah. not. The higher that percentage is, the more likely it's going to rain because either the, this weather system that's you know bringing us the rain is like very widespread coverage and it's definitely coming so there's you know, quite a certainty in that 
the whole area will be covered by precipitation. Um, when it's a smaller chance, it's more that like, well, there's going to be some scattered showers around. So someone will get rain probably, but the odds that you do actually are lower. Yeah, so I plan my morning bike ride on whether it's going to rain or not. My threshold is if it says 25% or less, I will yeah. bike. If it's above that, I won't. Yeah. But I, I, usually, just anecdotally, below 25%, even if it does rain, usually it's not that bad. Yeah. So. And it's like, you know, you can go read also the actual forecast discussion and see, like, well, what is this? Is it, you know, a front coming through where there's going to be a line of storms? Or is it kind of scattered stuff where, again, it's just somewhat at that point just luck whether or not you're you're hit by it um but for, i mean for your bike i mean how long are you riding your bike for about 20 minutes but yeah so i mean that you should just do some now casting and look at the radar on an app on your phone just and say it. like do i see any rain out there now if not i'm good to go <laughs> <laughs> that's fair well my, my negotiation is usually i'm, I'm biking up meridian okay. right so i'll go at 6 a.m yeah so it's a question of do i wake up at 5 yeah or do are I you wake gonna up at seven? wake up then yeah. got it so you're gonna make the decision the night before i try to but i look at it right away in the morning so so I'll blame you next time you go back. <laughs> right. Just email Allison. Yeah. I can't believe you got this wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> Just hate mail. All right. Cuddle Puppy, you are absolutely right. I missed one earlier. A big spooky skeleton asked, why do hurricanes never hit California but affect similar latitudes elsewhere? Yeah. So it has to do with you know, California being on the east side of the ocean basin so it's california's on the well, west coast of the u.s but east side of the pacific ocean and hurricanes tend to form you know at tropical latitudes and then they move to the west and poleward so north in the northern hemisphere so the hurricanes that form in the pacific in the eastern pacific they form down near you know costa rica kind of down there and they move west you know away from from where California would be. Um, whereas here, you know, on the east coast of the US, which is on the western side of the Atlantic Ocean, um, the hurricanes are forming further east out in the ocean and coming towards us. So it's just because of what side of the ocean basin they're on. Um, you'd have to have a storm, a hurricane take a really weird track to get there. And also the ocean temperatures are pretty cold off the coast of California because of the ocean currents that come down from the north there and cause upwelling of cold oh. water from below along the coast and so any storm that would get in that area would you know weaken pretty quickly with those cold waters <laughs> the jaded lesbian oh my god i love that name dr wing <laughs> thanks my <laughs> thank to my thanks my dad for having wing as a last name i mean but realistically you should have been a uh... The birdologist. Yeah, uh, ornithologist. Ornithologist. There we go. Chose the wrong career. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jaden. All right. Um, some, we should probably do another prediction. Which okay. one do you want to do? Uh, pause briefly. Are you good on cider? You need another one? I'm still good. Um. Yeah, I don't, we can do... We could, maybe the one about how many hit Tallahassee. We were talking about how there's been more since yes. I arrived in Tallahassee. The second one, yeah. Oh, this one looks long. I might not have cut this down properly. Too many characters. Yep. <laughs> oh, I thought I cut How that many down hurricanes there. hit Tallahassee per year? There we go. <laughs> I like the options on this one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not following, click the follow button. Um, get your standard internet units and get ready to answer this science question. On is this is on average? Yeah. All right. On average, how many Tallahassee hurricanes do we get per year? Or how many hurricanes hit Tallahassee per year? Is it zero or greater than one? I guess we could have done greater than one less than one i suppose yeah <laughs> but we'll see how this one turns out what's the yeah here's how it was originally how many tropical cyclones is tallahassee most likely to be impacted by in a year but we only get 42 characters so that's what we want 
How many tropical cyclones is Tallahassee most likely to be impacted by in a year? Those <laughs> 37 hurricanes? <laughs> Thank you, Gohaku. <laughs> uh, I like it. Uh-oh. <laughs> in a row. <laughs> Oh, uh, that was a clerk's joke, presumably. 37 hurricanes in a row? <laughs> There's a Nintendo game called Pilot Wings. I think I've seen that game. It's where you're... Is that the skydiving one? Wings NES. We could bust that out. Uh... Yeah, the Super Nintendo game, Pilot Wings. I think Darbian was speedrunning this game, actually. All right, Tallahassee hurricanes per year. Um, so the question, the full question is, how many tropical cyclones is Tallahassee most likely to be impacted by in a year? So this is a likelihood question. Is the answer zero or greater than one? Put your guesses or your bets in there now. Um, which one is it? Hurricane season is several months right. It can't be every day. True. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. 37 hurricanes. June, June through November. June through November. All right, Allison, what's the answer to... Let's read the full one. How many tropical cyclones is Tallahassee most likely to be impacted by in a year? Zero is the most likely number. Um, the, 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 the most has ever been hit by in a year or impacted by, you know, kind of hurricanes coming, you know, within you know, close enough to, to Tallahassee to have impacts here. It's three was the most, hmm. um, but uh, I think it's been like two or three times, not recently, mm -hmm. like in like the forties or something like that. Okay. Um, and I think there's been 11 years where it's been more than one. Um, but the vast, and this is over the, you know, since, you know, 1850, we're counting here mm -hmm. just statistically. You know, there's a much higher chance of us getting hit by zero, by zero than by one, two, or three, and it's never been more than three. Um, so, yeah, I mean, recent recent experience might, you know, <laughs> bias bias that, your your instincts on that's that answer. The Allison but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, 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 exactly. The force models need to be redone. Yeah. All right. Which is low. It is lower odds than some other parts of Florida, mm. for sure. I suppose Tallahassee. We are the armpit of. Yeah, of the Gulf. We are. It's a uh, hurricanes have to take a very specific track to get here. Uh, yeah, other parts of Florida, um, South Florida, further west on the Gulf Coast have much, um, and the Atlantic coastline have a much higher chance. Gohaku, interesting. I thought hurricanes from Caribbean would make its way to Florida. They it do, does, but not. But our, not. Yeah, not Tallahassee so like, necessarily. That's Florida, actually. That way for you guys. That's Tallahassee right up there. So it has to go like up and around. And I mean, so so that's interesting. You're in, you're in Tallahassee. You're an expert in meteorology. And so when you see on the news, a hurricane is coming, like I'm watching like weather.com or something, and I'm trying mm -hmm. to see what their speculation is. Do you have additional insights? Do you make decisions differently than... <laughs> Um, Not to put pressure on you, I won't email you during a hurricane. Well, how do you re like? We, I mean, we panic. We're from Minnesota. We don't understand hurricanes. Yeah, <laughs> like we we've driven away up to like South Carolina just to get away for a. That's a totally else. reasonable response. Um, yeah, I mean, the National Hurricane Center is the number one trusted source for information. They're the experts. They've got the best forecasts, the best information, and then you know your local. National Weather Service office, you know, here in Tallahassee or wherever you are, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to kind of then make it specific to your location in terms of what impacts you should be expecting. So you should always listen to those people and your, you know, local governments. And if there is an evacuation order, you know, get out, do it right. Yeah. It's it's actually relatively rare that they actually do issue evacuation orders, and it's only when you know the situation is pretty dire. Um, but you know. You know, when there's a hurricane coming, you know, myself and my colleagues and students, we're definitely following it closely, looking at all the forecast models on our own, looking at the satellite data. And, you know, we all make our own forecasts and, you know, interpret, look at what the National Hurricane Center is saying and kind of, you know, put our own spin on it. Um, but ultimately, you know, they're the 
the best source of information. So our first, I guess it was 2016 we decided was the first big one, right? That, that was when our daughter was like six months old. Yeah. And we're like, we just don't want to be here with the tree through the house. Like, yeah. We're just going to bail. <laughs> and well, that, that was our first one. So. And that's the thing here. Like, you don't even need necessarily a super strong storm for there to be damage because, I mean... Look, our trees come down in like generic afternoon thunderstorm. <laughs> yep. Right? So. Yeah. And you saw the trees around this house. Yeah. It's, just, it's slightly terrifying. I just bought a house recently and. Congratulations. The first, and I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> the first three oh. weeks I owned the house, the power went out each week um, because oh. of thunderstorms. And I was like, is this going to be a trend? I don't like this. <laughs> Seems to have stabilized, but. Yeah, the, we in Tallahassee, we have what they call these canopy roads where there's, you know, these big old trees overhanging the roads and overhanging all the power lines and their branches come down pretty easily and cause a lot of problems. Oh, nice. nice. Oh, ruthless. Yes. You just knock him off. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a gangster down. move. Somebody should clip that. <laughs> <laughs> Cuddle puppy. I went to the North Pole to avoid the last hurricane. Unfortunately, there was a polar vortex. <laughs> I like it. All right. I got to catch up on some questions here. Uh, Gohaku wants to know, what are some fun ways to get young kids into weather science? I mean, bring them to a hurricane is what we learned earlier. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things I like to do is actually to visit, you know, elementary school classrooms and talk to them about, about weather. Um, we do some experiments with a a tank of water that spins and we can make weather in the tank and that's fun to see you know to talk about weather and the different types of systems we have but i find that that kids young kids are really inquisitive and interested and in, and really knowledgeable about things they notice things about our weather and generally are very curious Aww. so can i plug your youtube channel sure it, it has those right it has the it has the, the yes. water tank demos yeah yeah, so the ones I have these videos, the the ones on the, my YouTube channel, those videos are ones I made for my class, my college class, but mm -hmm. we've had we've made ones that are geared they're not on the YouTube channel yet. Maybe they will be eventually. But we have versions of them that are kind of geared towards younger audiences as well. So these these are just demos, right? You don't yes. use these for actual data? I mean, um well, I don't use them for actual data, but some people do. We actually have researchers here at FSU in the Geophysical Fluid Dynamic Institute that do do more careful tank experiments um, for data that they you know use in their research studies. I mean that's interesting. So that's it's it's like a, it's lab a, experiment. It's yeah. a fluid system. It's a yes. liquid, but yeah. you can model atmospheric dynamics with fluid dynamics. Because the atmosphere is a fluid. Yeah. In fact, oh, that's... yeah, air is a fluid. Believe it or not, just like water, but you know slightly different density <laughs> dense, and yeah. more compressible. Um, but yeah, the, the equations that govern how fluids, water and air moves, they are the same equations, um, same dynamics. I mean, that I'm, I'm blown away by how often fluid dynamics gets implemented because it's everything from like, apparently hurricanes to the movement of pe people outside a football stadium after the game, <laughs> right? Or traffic or turbulence over a wing. It's, like, yeah. it's all fluid dynamics, probably, yeah. which is pretty crazy oh cuddle puppy has a c complaint can we talk about how the atmospheric scientist keeps getting lightning bolt items <laughs> <laughs> hashtag rigged <laughs> so cuddle puppy if you're not familiar or allison do you, are you familiar with rubber banding in video games no so so a lot of racing games especially nintendo if they want to keep the game fair or keep it you know relatively close the people in last get better items than the mm. people in oh front. yeah and it's <laughs> That is why if you're losing, you get the best items and you catch up. But yeah, Cuddle Puppy, you're not wrong. It's rigged, but not by us. Make it more fun, I guess. It's not competitive gameplay. All right, the the jaded lesbian wants to know. I have a question. I was reading about the New York outage, and they lost power for two days because the same place got hit by lightning three times in a row. What are the oh. chances of that actually happening? Um, well, I mean, the, the whole idea that you can't by, get hit, the same place can't get hit by lightning twice, that's an urban legend. Um, you can get hit by lightning twice. Um, it's maybe a little less likely because, I mean, lightning is when you have, um, you know, a current that runs between, you know, opposite sign charges, you know, between the surface and the cloud, for example. And 
So when that lightning strikes, it kind of releases, you know, the the energy, you know, by kind of connecting those and making the current. Um, and so it can take more time for that charge separation to build back up again. But yeah, it's definitely possible to get hit by lightning twice in the same place. Three times in a row. Yeah. I mean, they have times. lightning rods intentionally to actually induce that discharge. Right. Well, so, so then you can control, yeah. you know, where it's going to discharge and you have it hit somewhere, you know, where it direct that current into a specific place rather than it decide on its own. <laughs> Park Ranger Roy Sullivan got struck by lightning seven times. Oof. Like, it's hard not to laugh at that, because that's absurd. Yeah. Like, you gotta wonder if there's some sort of, like, Allison-type effect Karma, with lightning yeah. bolt with him. Roy, Roy just was something that's, about it. That's him. pretty... Bad luck or poor decision-making in being in vulnerable <laughs> yeah. locations during Thunderstorm. <laughs> An interesting career choice. His name was Roy Lightning. It would just all come together. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously not in a row. Oh, back to the, the lightning bolts. She keeps getting lightning bolts in third and fourth place. I thought you only got them in seventh and eighth. I, I, no somebody, explanation. Somebody has broken down these numbers, I'm sure. Somebody has deconstructed this game to the heart. and Yeah. Well, which one are we on now? Is this, is this, this uh, is the last cup. This is Star Cup? Yeah. Or, Whatever the last one is. I think Star, yeah. Rainbow Road's coming up, which I'm sure to fly off of multiple times. So in the speed run, they intentionally jump off the side so they can land on the platform underneath. Yeah, but that requires like precision on where you oh, yes. fall off the sides. I don't have that level of control. But luck. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's bank on luck. All right. Gohaku wants to know, are, the hur are, are there hurricanes near the Florida Keys? Yeah, for sure. Um... Keys are, they're vulnerable. They're sticking out there in the ocean. They're very low lying, you know, basically at sea level, um, can be overrun by storm surge. They absolutely get impacted by hurricanes. All right, so we're over an hour in. Anyone just joining us? This is Ask a Scientist Gaming, mediocre gameplay expert level science. My guest today is Dr. Allison Wing. He's playing some Mario Kart while answering questions about tropical storms, cyclones, um, extreme weather, climate change, um, we've got a ro roller coaster ride. Bad movies, good movies. <laughs> Twister turns out is okay. <laughs> it's Meteorologist movie. approved. Yep. So we'll take that. A big spooky skeleton has redeemed a request a factoid. Okay. It's time to drop a knowledge bomb. Oh man. Okay. So I did prepare some factoids, but probably I'm gonna forget them. Out. Should it be like a weather-related factoid well, or it can a personal be we, factoid? We do not specify anything. Okay. Well. I'll say my, like, one of my personal factoids. This is my, like, you know, when you're in those, you know, kind of icebreaker activities and everyone has to share a random fact about your, yourself. My go-to is that five years was a big year for me. In addition to being hit by a Hurricane Bob, I also, um, I saved a child's life from, wow. from drowning when I was five. Um, this younger child, you know, fell in a swimming pool and didn't know how to swim. I was in the pool already. I also didn't know how to swim, but I had swimmies on. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, you knew how to swim. No. Swimmies. I had floaties or swimmies on or whatever. And I was able to swim over to her and rescue her from drowning before her mother realized she had fallen into the pool and rescued her. So wow. that's my claim to fame. Saved a life. I, age five. I mean, that's amazing. A lot of people will go their entire lives. You, you, you peaked at five years old. Yeah. <laughs> like it's all downhill from here. <laughs> Unless it happens again. Do you bring your floaties with regularly? <laughs> I do know how to swim now. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing. We've got to get our daughters in swim lessons. So they're, they're uh, two and a half and five years old. But yeah. the five-year-old, like, COVID hit when we'd start doing swimming oh, lessons. Yeah. So now, yeah. It's a good life skill, especially living in here in Florida. There's lots of bodies of water around exactly between the water and the alligators yeah so where are you from originally i'm from new york i'm new york, from okay. white plains new york oh, oh white plains new york which is about half an hour north of new york city all right so yeah. you're, you're used to the snow but not necessarily the humidity in the yeah i mean it's definitely humid in new york in the summer but not florida levels of humidity and not for nearly as long as it's humid and hot here I mean, I mean so, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say here it's. I mean, it's kind of disgusting from mid-May to 
November or something, and it's only disgusting for a few weeks in New York. <laughs> I love New York. Go Haku. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so so you landed in Florida. Was it was yes. was I mean, your your profession as well as the location, was that part of this decision? Yeah, I mean, when I was looking for jobs, for faculty jobs, I applied all over the country. And, you know, one of the offers I had was here at FSU. Um, but yeah, given that I, you know, study hurricanes and tropical meteorology, I was definitely drawn to here. I mean, FSU, our department, our meteorology program, you know, has a long history of expertise in tropical meteorology. And so that definitely appealed for me as a place, you know, to work um so i mean so is there a bias theoretically you could do your research in kansas yes, right like is yeah. there a bias in where people end up is there I mean, to some extent I, I mean yes my research i can do anywhere mm -hmm. but you know i do it is an advantage that he, here in florida you know hurricanes are something of great you know personal interest to everyone basically and the general public is actually pretty knowledgeable about hurricanes here in florida and there's a lot of you know public interest in that so mm -hmm. that certainly helps me um and when it comes to kind of recruiting students you know when people are thinking about oh what school should i go to to study hurricanes they think <laughs> oh well, if they get hurricanes in florida maybe i should go there yeah so that it definitely helps in that regard oh that makes sense yeah but yeah my actual research i mean like i mean yeah, I worked as a postdoctoral scientist also studying hurricanes, you know, in New York at Columbia University before coming here, mm -hmm. you know, did my PhD at MIT in Boston. So, you know, certainly studied hurricanes in those locations. Actually, in my PhD, I didn't study hurricanes. It was sort of funny. I, I went to MIT because I wanted to work with Carrie Emanuel, who is one of the world's, you know, renowned hurricane scientists. And I went there and I worked with him. And I, I, I didn't do hurricanes in my research. My entire dissertation was on non-rotating, non-spinning weather systems um, and cloud clusters. And the, the physics was related to hurricanes and eventually I applied that to hurricanes. But I always kind of tell that story sometimes to students when they're kind of like, oh, well, I thought I wanted to study this and I yeah. ended up not. And, you know, well, and I'm like, well, you know, your career evolves and sometimes you go in different directions than you thought, but sometimes you also end up circle back to kind of what you originally, you know, thought you might want to do. I mean, that's so, so do you have a general trend of incoming grad students? So like in chemistry, everyone's in organic chemistry because that's what they took until mm -hmm. their senior year and they'll take like physical and materials and all sorts of different classes. Is there a like default people all think they're this until they actually get to grad school? Well, definitely hurricanes is the number one topic of interest amongst the graduate students that apply to our program for sure. Yeah. Um, for undergraduate students, you know, coming in, probably most people think they want to be a forecaster, you know, work for the National Weather Service or be on TV. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of discover many of them do do <laughs> that, but they discover that, you know, there are many other options that you can do many other paths you can take with a meteorology degree. And, um, some of them, you know, yeah, go in different directions with that, whether it be research or consulting or, um, you know, applied forecasting or things like that. It's not all about forecasting. All right, here we are. Rainbow, Rainbow Road. Road, are you ready for this? Oh this my is, God. This is it, right? This is the last race? This is it. No, no pressure. Do you want questions through this or do you want to focus? <laughs> we, this is, we can this chill, is we can relax for three minutes. Yeah. You can throw a prediction up. That's good, Which, which one do, do you want to do? I don't know, I can't look at it. <laughs> no, I'm the one forcing the distraction. Okay, we'll, we'll, do, an, we'll do an Allison question here. This one's kind of fun. Okay. So this one's no pressure. You don't even have to think during this one. Sounds good. All right. Is everyone ready with their standard internet units? It is time to gamble for made up imaginary internet points that do nothing but make us drink alcohol and give you factoids. But the question we're gonna throw up, you guys have two minutes to answer. The question is how many countries has Dr. Allison Wing been to? Now, does this include like airport stopovers or is this does it, actual No, visits? I think places where I've spent the night at mm. least. That's I a think, good criteria. Yeah. Sleeping in that country for at least a night. Or like, for, I think actually one of them, I maybe didn't sleep the night, but I like specifically went to that country 
Yeah. No. Yeah. The airport doesn't count. You it's have to have like had like a specific visit in okay. that country. All right. So with that criteria, how many countries has Dr. Allison Wing been to? Is it greater than ten or less than ten? So Mike Shatruck did this question last stream, actually. Yeah. Was that did I send that list to you or you you might have saw that? I think I think you did mention that question. I was like, that's a good question. Yeah, no, it's just a fun, like a fun random one. factoid, and they can't possibly know the answer to. Yeah. Uh, but maybe what do you know about Allison and her Mario Kart gameplay that I mean I've really already curious? listed a couple of countries I've been to, so That's true. The answer is at least the United States. Yes. <laughs> I don't think I counted that in my number that I gave as the answer. <laughs> oh no, is this going to change the outcome? <laughs> nope, don't, don't reveal, don't reveal. <laughs> We're too much meta information. They're going to take it too far. Why is it less than one an option? What if she spent her entire life on international waters? <laughs> that, that still falls under less than Ted. Cuddle puppies are our ask a scientist troll <laughs> who manages to find ways uh, Fun ways to undermine. Tropical Geek, did you unlock that? That's awesome. Take take my standard internet units. All right, you guys have about 15 seconds. How many countries has Dr. Wing uh, been to? Is okay. it greater than 10 or less than 10? They are pretty confident it is less than 10. I'll show you the stats when it goes. Comes out. Oh. I, I haven't even been watching where you're sitting on this. Is this I'm a do second. or die race? Um in terms of the overall cup oh i don't know i haven't been doing super well this cup i don't think i definitely haven't been winning everything but here's your redemption arc yeah i want to win this all right i'm gonna wait till you're done to do this prediction okay so everyone if you came here for science we're pausing science momentarily for mediocre gameplay <laughs> no excellent gameplay excellent. yeah just have to avoid my own bananas. So this one has mostly the border. Is it the the higher? Yeah, higher I think CCs I that think that can... they. Yeah, I think I stayed on fifty. I should have gone to a hundred, but I felt like I needed a handicap. Oh, no here. worries. We do not judge here. We cheat code on everything. You are not cheating, by the way, in this game. This is this is raw. This Alice is real. Wing this is real. She's earning every place she gets in this race. I think I do the worst on the ones where something like falls on you, like in Bowser's castle, like those doors that close on you. Mm -hmm. This one's a good at. And also the penguin, whatever one had the penguins. Yep, that was the, the ice levels. Yeah. So I never, I didn't play much. I played the Super Nintendo version of this game a lot. Yeah. Did you, did you battle mode back in the day? Oh, uh, occasionally, the yes, yeah. yeah. Did it, uh oh, a Donkey Kong on my tail. Oh. And we will catch up on questions after Rainbow Road. You're giving Allison some time to think. Rainbow Road is long. Yeah, this is a really long race. I'm sure, the speed run record is like 16 seconds or something ridiculous. Oh. What? To risk your own shells. Oh no, oh no, oh no! <laughs> Here we go. Oh, I flew right into him. So I think you're still on the second lap. This is the third lap. This third is the lap. final lap. This is the moment of truth. Uh, no lightning bolt. Cuddle puppy. <laughs> Not rigged. He was going to rig it. Now would be the time. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, that was a two for one. Yeah. I have to say, I haven't hit the wall too many times, so if there were no walls, I maybe would have only fallen off like once. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag formerly rigged. <laughs> <laughs> Conveniently rigged. Systematically rigged. <laughs> uh, I like it. 
but anyone just joining us, Ask a Scientist Gaming, mediocre gameplay expert level science. Uh, today's guest is Dr. Allison Wing. She is an expert uh, meteorologist, atmospheric scientist studying uh, tropical cyclone formation, uh, climate change, and how it affects storms, um, uh, mm -hmm. modeling uh, storm systems. So she is happy to answer any questions you have, but she won't answer them until Rainbow Road is over. So. <laughs> Throw your questions in chat, and I i promise I have a Word document that I'm going to catch up on all of these after she finishes this race. You guys can't see, but I'm, like, clenching the accelerator so hard, even though I know <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. I, I should give you the warning ahead of time, because I think everyone that leaves, their hands are sore after this, because you're out of training. You, you don't have the muscles you want yeah, to Yeah, totally. Oh! Ruthless. Is that it? This is... This, don't hit the banana. Don't hit the banana. Ladies and gentlemen, is that it? Yes. I'm a Luigi. No. G GGs. Get some Bowser GGs. Reese's Pieces Redeem. Take, take a drink. All right. Cheers, yeah, Allison. Cheers. Congratulations on your victory. Um, again, Reese's Pieces, thank you for stopping by. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you all for joining us. You did it. Whew. The, that was exhausting. Feels satisfying, right? Like that's one thing bank, video games give you is that that gratification. <laughs> like, like research, we grind so hard to get those moments, but video games, we get them all the time. Yeah. Right. Those it's, little victories. It's, it's very rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> Reese's pieces just returned from the bar. All right, Allison, we need an outcome. How many countries have you been to? Greater than ten or less than ten? Greater than ten. Greater than ten. Yeah. So I think the number, not counting the U.S., the number I had was 13 yep. when I thought about it, um, which is interesting. So I had, I went to Canada once in high school. We had like a high school orchestra trip to Montreal. But other than that, I didn't leave the country at all until my last year of graduate school. Wow. Um, so I was like, I don't know, 27 or something like that, 20, mm -hmm. 27. 20, yeah, 27, um, when I had the opportunity to go to a summer school and workshop in Greece, uh, which was really awesome. And then I kind of quickly made up for lost time after that, you know, mostly getting to travel for work to go to conferences in different places, participate in a couple of field campaigns. So I mentioned, you know, I've been on some field experiments, flying through, taking measurements of tropical cloud systems um, from Barbados and Costa Rica. Um, I've traveled to conferences in Switzerland, Germany, France, Australia, um, Austria, um, the UK. I, I, not to a conference in the UK, but I've visited some work colleagues in the UK. Um, I also have been to Ireland twice. That's, that's probably Ireland is the only other than Canada. I, well, I have been to Canada for work. I think Ireland's the only foreign country I've been to for solely fun for pleasure i guess rather than business my sister studied abroad in ireland so i went to visit her when she was studying at trinity college in dublin That's and fun. then one of my friends from graduate school is irish and um got married and myself and all my grad school friends went to his wedding in ireland so those are my two ireland trips so for whatever reason the viewership was skeptical on lag greater than 10. What? so it's three percent they got a 30 to 1 payout on the on the greater than 10. So Mike Shatrucks, I don't know if I told you his answer. What was his answer? 37. Whoa. Yeah, no, he... Oh, my God. So he's Ukrainian. He was dating his, his wife long distance. And okay. due to visa issues, rather than meeting up in Ukraine or the U.S., they would meet up in random countries. In other countries. Yeah, yeah. so that was their travels. But Well, I think also if you, like, have lived in Europe for any period of time, see it's yeah. a lot easier to travel around to a lot of different countries. Yeah, but I, I had a similar story to you. My first time getting on an airplane was an RU program to Notre Dame. Okay. To do chemistry research over the summer as a like sophomore in, in college. And then my first international flight was it was to Germany for the meeting of Nobel laureates in Lindau. Wow. And it was just like a happy coincidence. I one of our colleagues at USC was a Nobel Prize winner and he's just like, You guys wanna go? And I'm like, sure, that would wow, be awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, no, it was, what it was an a, incredible opportunity. It was an amazing experience. All right, so you took first. Yeah. Look at that. Rainbow Road plus the overall cup win. Um, Winning. Yeah, no, it feels good. This, <laughs> this conquered, is what you wanted, right? Mario Kart. 
All right, what are we on to next? What are we What are we gonna do? Um, Super Mario Land. Yeah, let's do Super Mario Land. All right, so watch me are, all of a sudden start failing. We are going I'm gonna back, die ladies and gentlemen. Times. It is time. To play some Game Boy, actually. All right, so Super Net Mario Land released for Game Boy in 1989. So this was the first Mario game on the Game Boy system. And it is black and white. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually back in the day, it was like green and yellow. Yeah. <laughs> Off-screen colors. Oh, wow. Cuddle Puppy was keeping track. Rainbow Road actually mattered. Whoever won that oh, won the cup. Whoa, so, so that was you, clutch. Yeah, no, you clutch victory. Well done. Even after Ciders, even while talking science, Allison takes out the win. This will be documented forever on YouTube, by the way. So <laughs> Excellent. You can send it to your family and say, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, DK Donkey Kong was tied with you going into the finale. That's really fun. Oh, yeah. And he was up. He was there right at the end. It was close between he and I. Yeah. 80 finale, three for three on the quiz question so far. Congratulations, considering two of those questions were just about Allison. They, they know you. <laughs> or lucky. Yeah. We'll, we'll take it however it goes. It's better to be lucky than good sometimes. Oh, no. Spider. All right. So let's catch up on some questions. So go Haku. Oh, one disclaimer about this game. Allison does have infinite lives. So we are cheating on this one, but that's okay. Because this is I a need really it. hard game. This I need is, it. It's unforgiving. Uh, all the early Nintendo games were very ruthless. All right, Gohaku wants to know, not sure if anyone asked this, but who decides the name of tro Tropical Storms and Hurricanes? Oh, it's like my life goal to be on that committee. Oh. <laughs> you saved a child's life, but this, <laughs> this is where your goal lies. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, a committee of the World Meteorological Organization um, made up of representatives from the different agencies um, responsible for forecasting hurricanes and tropical cyclones in, in different parts of the world. So there's a list of names for each ocean basin that gets hit by tropical cyclones. And so for the Atlantic, it's you know primarily people from the United States that serve on that committee. And they come up with, they have, I think, five lists of names that, that rotate through. Um, you know, they have one letter per name and then when they retire her names of hurricanes for storms that have been especially devastating, they have to come up with a new name. Hurricane Allison, oh. for example. Tropical Storm. Tropical Storm Allison. Allison. There we yeah. go. Yep. But um, yeah, so one interesting thing. So we had, you know, recently, right in 2020, we had a ridiculous number of hurricanes. I forget the actual number, but it was the most ever um so we had to go oh so this is why i need internet infinite lives we had to go into the greek letters basically um and which was the second time we had to do it the first time would have been 2005 but they've actually gotten rid of that now so hmm. um no more greek letters if we go over 25 storms in a season um instead now they have like backup names like an extra list of names and so it'll kind of start over from a and go to that backup list so do you think they consult like the most popular kids names like they, they could be strategic and oh i keep thinking i can just like walk up there but i can't yeah this game has some weird hit boxes like where mario is and what he actually hits is not yeah <laughs> not the same thing it's like right. i need to actually jump here apparently nice Ooh, veteran <laughs> so you can tell you played this a lot. <laughs> like, you can just see it in certain choices I, I you make. I swear I haven't and, played it in like 20 yeah, yeah. years. Oh, but that doesn't matter. This is ingrained in your psyche. Like, yeah. This, this was just part of your existence for a period of time. It was. All right. Twitcher wants to know, does electrical activity in the sky contribute to storm formation? That's fun. Um, you know, I don't. I don't fully know the answer to that question. My instinct is no. Um, electrical activity being lightning, I guess, is an indicator that there is an intense storm happening. Um, either, you know, strong thunderstorms that are very tall, deep thunderstorm clouds. Um, 
when we hurricanes don't typically have a ton of lightning associated with them but when we do see a lot of lightning activity like from satellite imagery or something like that associated with hurricanes that is an indicator that the hurricane is in the process of intensifying really rapidly um so there definitely is an association between thunderstorm activity and the intensity of a storm and lightning electrical activity but i don't know if it's a two-way interaction or if the lightning and electricity is just an indicator not a forcing so there was a i, I don't know this is a reddit post but there, there's a rare event where it snows and lightning simultaneously. thunder snow yeah it has a very particular like People are into it. Thunder right? snow. That, Thunder snow is real, awesome. It's a real thing. It's yeah. a real rare event. And... It's rare because, yeah, it's, it's difficult, unusual to have basically clouds that are deep enough and tall enough and in, have intense enough convection associated with them to get thunder and lightning and have it still be cold enough to snow. Um, so that's unusual. But yeah, when it happens, it's pretty awesome. I have never oh, experienced it personally, and I would be very excited if I did. Yeah, I've, I've seen the photos and the clips of it. There's some great like videos of like Jim Cantori, who's a you know well-known you know weather forecaster, you know on the Weather Channel, just like having his mind blown by thunderstorm. <laughs> I think I've seen those clips. Yeah, <laughs> that's where that's probably where I learned about it. Any viral video. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reese's Pieces has a request. If you do end up naming hurricanes, I, they, they feel like you should ruin names like Aiden, Braden, and Caden. <laughs> <laughs> you will have that power if you're on that committee. Right. <laughs> with, with great power. Comes great responsibility. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Don't, don't take it too lightly. <laughs> All right. Um, Gohaku wants to know, what is acid rain and why does Tampa and Tallahassee have so much of it? Um, acid rain is when, ooh, there's... Yeah, basically the rain that's falling from the sky is acidic. Um, I don't, I don't know actually. I, I didn't, wasn't aware that actually Tallahassee had a lot of acid rain. Yeah. Um, but it has to do with what you know, particulates and pollutants are in the atmosphere when that rain is formed. I mean, early on, uh, coal burning and stuff when they didn't desulfurize it, it was a problem. The sulfates that go in the air and it react with water generate sulfuric acid. And that's one of the major contributors. But a lot of the the scrubbing and stuff that's done with coal processing now gets rid of a lot of that. Like they notice those issues really. Oh, see, like I jumped on him, like on his tail. Shouldn't that kill him, so, not me? So I think he's the main Bowser boss. I don't think you can like. I can't crush him. I have yeah, to just go yeah, under him. Go or. Under. Uh... But yeah, there's some really cool, uh, we have this in our gen chem textbook because it's acid-based chemistry. If you have like limestone, limestone dissolves in acid. And so early acid rain had a major problem on a lot of artwork that was made of limestone and stuff. Oh, and you could actually yeah. tell um, where the source of the sulfur was coming from based on the direction of the wind and what face of the art was being destroyed. <laughs> Jumped right into Which that. is kind of crazy, but yeah, I didn't know that was an issue in Tampa and Tallahassee. Yeah, no, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, it's not as much the other issue is i mean we are on the limestone basin so mm -hmm. acidification of water plus dehydration uh turns out sinkholes are a thing yeah that sort of sinkholes are kind of terrifying I yeah i'd argue i'd argue that's more terrifying than any of these other phenomena because you just you can't predict it for the most part yeah. I, I guess to some degree you know what where it can occur but i remember this and i remember having a really hard time making it past this line you're from Minnesota. Have you never experienced it? I don't think I've ever seen thunder snow. <laughs> that scuzzbot is my brother, by the way. <laughs> Probably your best chance for thunder snow is from like a nor'easter because, yeah, the type of when winter storms you have in Minnesota aren't typically going to produce that intense level of convection. Yeah. Um, I mean, nor'easters. Those are you could have you know winds associated with that that are as powerful as a hurricane. Um, Sister-in-law. Oh yeah, that's as. You guys got to change your names. There's a Scuzzbot and I can't remember the other one. Anyway. So that does make sense that I don't remember seeing one. I, I mean, and it's fairly rare in general, so. All right. Homegirl, homegirl wants to know, how far in advance would you trust a weather forecast to be most accurate? Seven days, ten days, just look out the window. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Mike. Oh, okay, we got it. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so I would say, yeah, around seven to 10 days is, you know, when we start to see forecast skill really deteriorate, um, which has a lot to do with just our fundamental limits of predictability. Um, 
you know, the atmosphere is what's known as a chaotic system, which means that, you know, small errors early on amplify with time and grow. And, you know, we're never, ever going to have a perfect starting point for our model simulations, right? You know, we would have to know precisely where every molecule in the atmosphere is, and we will never, ever know that. So there always are initial errors, and those grow with time. And around a week to 10 days is when they are um, large enough that they can kind of swamp, you know, forecast skill. But it depends, you know, on the particular thing that you're interested in. You know, for hurricanes, you know, I wouldn't trust a hurricane intensity forecast, you know, a week out. I might trust, you know, is there going to be a hurricane in this general vicinity? That's maybe something we can now say a week out. But for a specific, you know, track um, forecast, it's more... I would say three to five days is when that's really reliable and intensity, you know, really more, yeah, one to three days ahead of time. Again, like you might be able to say like, oh yeah, there's going to be a strong storm, but exactly how strong it is. <laughs> You're absolutely murdering those guys, <laughs> pausing over them. So I'll, I'll reframe that question in, in something directly relevant to my life. When do you start freaking out about hurricanes in Tallahassee? When, when oh, I start freaking out about them as soon as I see that one is like kind of on the approach. But this is kind of like in part maybe like some of the curse of being very, you know, constantly following the weather and the hurricanes is that, you know, I'll see them when it's, yeah, on the week long forecast or so on and so forth. And then, you know, I just track it ever since then mm -hmm. um and then you know some of them you know end up you know going off in a different direction but yeah i start worrying about it right away so just like your department have a collective just like freak out or everyone watching a screen like yeah part? well we have like a uh, we have a map room um one of our conference rooms has 20 um like 40 inch television screens in it <laughs> in like a grid and we've got all sorts of different you know Oh, I ran right That's into your situation it. room. Yeah. 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 Weather maps and everything there. And yeah, definitely there'll be students hanging out there, keeping track of the latest forecast. So that's in your new building? That's in our new building. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. We, um, our department, we moved into a new building in January 2020, then prompted to not be in that new building for a few years oh, during, because of, COVID. of yeah, the yeah, pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really nice. I mean, so your department's interesting. Like when we joke, it's the earth, wind and fire department, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's what do you guys, your earth, ocean and atmospheric science. And so you have geography, you have geology, geology oceanography yeah, it's, and meteorology, it's a broad... environmental science. It's a very broad. We have like 40 faculty right now, 150 graduate students, 600 undergrads. It's a big department, bigger than some of the other colleges. Yeah. At FSU. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very big and a new building. And nice are new you partitioned building. by four floors in terms? No, of the, everyone what's... is kind of mixed in together, which is which is right. nice. Yeah, that's probably. I'm on the sixth floor though, the top floor. Oh, nice. The best floor. <laughs> the best floor. Do you have weather equipment on top of the building? We do. We have a that's instrument awesome. <clears throat> like observation deck where we got some instruments on there. Oh, I think if I run fast enough, I can run across those things. Let's try that. Hmm. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we have different instruments and we've got some cool instrumentation. Um, we also have like, we have a seismometer. Sorry, gotta get a running start here. No, don't jump. Okay. Nope. <laughs> There's something you can do to run fast. I, I There is on the original Mario. I've tried it on this one. The B button doesn't do anything. Oh. So I don't know if you... Yeah, oh, it, does. it totally you, does. It was, was yeah, it was B. Old B? Yeah. Interesting. So I played it a little bit earlier. So on one of the, the speedrunners I watch on Twitch was speedrunning this game, trying to get a record. Turns out the record is 12 minutes. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> what am I? What am I at so far? I have no idea. More than twelve Aww. minutes. We'll say. We should do another prediction at some point. Which yeah. Also, Scuzzbot has redeemed a request a factoid. Okay, request a factoid. Uh, let me see. Where are my other factoids? Um, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna remember any of them. I wrote <laughs> them down. Can I get my phone and look at my list? Yes, you can. You want to pause? <laughs> Let, let's do it. Let's pick a prediction and okay. I'll post that. And then we'll get back to the factoid. Because I already, I already gave my one good factoid. All the others are going to be much less <laughs> Saving exciting. Saving a kid's life is pretty good. Yeah. 
but science is fun too. Yeah, I had some good science here. Let me, this is a good point to pause. <laughs> Which one do you want? Let's do the one about, um, yeah, so as I said, I do a lot of computer modeling. So do you want to, yeah, that's a good one. Okay. All right, get your standard internet units out. Um, AD finale, now it's time to test. Can you go four for four on this one? All right, so this is going to be a computational power question. All right, if you're not following us, click the follow button, get additional units, and you can bet them accordingly, and you can do things like request a factoid or make us drink alcohol. It's totally up to you guys what you do with your standard internet units, but it is satisfying to win. Uh, just ask Cuddle Puppy a win 30 to 1 payout on the last one. So the question is, when Allison does her simulations on the computer, what is the number of computer processors she typically uses for these simulations? Is it less than 50 or greater than 50? So this is computer processors. What is the total number she uses for her calculations? Throw your predictions in there now. Are you good on Drift? Um, yeah, I'll take another one. Which one do you want? Um, no, what was, I think you have a Magners. Yeah. I'll have Magners. Since we were talking about foreign travel going to UK and Ireland, they have a lot of Magners there. I completely forgot a bottle opener, so I'm going to run and get one of those. Okay. Uh, but before that, before I leave, you have about a minute and 10 seconds. Make your guess now. What's the number of computer processors that Allison runs her simulations on? This is modeling, cyclone formation, and physics, force vectors, and all sorts of fun stuff. How many processors does she typically use to do that? Throw your predictions in now, and I'll be right back. Did you find your factoid? I did, yeah. Do you want me to... We can, oh, there we go, it died. I have, I have some hurricane factoids I can share and some other random personal factoids. But first I need to focus on getting past this dude. Thank you. All right, 15 seconds. I'm gonna have to actually transport my daughter to another room, so I will do this. Number of computer process. Cuddle puppy, are you going the cynical, the uh, the, the odds in your favor bet? I like it. All right, Alice. so how many computer processors do you typically use? Greater than 50. Greater than um, 50. So typically to run one of my cloud resolving model simulations where we are, um, Basically, simulating an imaginary hurricane or imaginary cloud cluster system um, with very small grid spacing so we can explicitly represent the clouds and the processes associated with them. Um, typically, I'll use between at least 64, often, you know, more than 100 or more than 200 processors. So, supercomputers are definitely required to run these simulations and do this research. Um, that's actually, you know, order 100 processors is, is pretty small actually in the realm of supercomputers so um they're you know other you know long-term climate modeling they use thousands and thousands of processors but i do many simulations so i kind of trade off each simulation is you know definitely too expensive to run on your laptop or your desktop computer but you can run many of them easily on a supercomputer and so i typically use um the NCARS, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NSF-sponsored supercomputer named Cheyenne out in Wyoming. That's where I run most of my model simulations. So I also do use the High Performance Computing Center on campus here at FSU. So definitely computational resources are essential for both forecasting atmospheric uh, weather as well as yeah, studying atmospheric science and doing research. They also generate a ton of data, these simulations. So this was another prediction we could have had, I thought about. So what was the typical number of processors? But then the, another one could be, what's the typical amount of output data that one of my simulations generates? Um, and the answer to that is around two terabytes of data for each simulation. Um, two terabytes yeah. of a hard drive. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, in my server, we're, we've got 16 terabyte hard drives now on my okay. server. But you can do eight of them. <laughs> yeah. It's the, at this point, really managing the data volume is a bigger issue than the computational actual mm -hmm. resources. And what kind of model do I use? So I, I run typically, it's an, it's a model that, you know, similar to a weather forecast model solves the same equations, um, you know, that come from the laws of physics that govern how atmospheric motions work, how weather systems form and move, how clouds form, all of that sort of fun stuff. Um, but the thing that I do is I typically take that model and I run it in a very idealized way. So I simulate an imaginary hurricane over an imaginary patch of the tropical ocean and use the model as a tool to probe the different mechanisms that um, contribute to tropical cyclone and hurricane development. Um, and the cool thing about that is we can um, kind of play God a little bit with these computer models and you can turn off different processes and see how that affects the evolution of the hurricane or whatever, ever, whatever other phenomena you're trying to simulate. So you can go in there and you know, make the clouds invisible and see what effect that has on the hurricane. You can go in there and turn off the sun. You can make it warmer, you can make it colder and see what those effects are. So it's a, you know, computer models, these, you know, numerical weather prediction, those types of models that we use, they are kind of our our laboratory for, for atmospheric science. It's, it's difficult to, you know, do, this simulate these sorts of things experimentally in the lab. So, you know, we do it in a numerical laboratory. Um, and, you know, those models are used again, both for prediction as well for research and understanding. So that was a response to Reese's pieces here. What yes. kind of models do you use? Yeah. I, I'm sad I missed the computational. You got the factoid as well? I did not share the factoid. So the factoid was, this is right. a, a, a hurricane related factoid. Actually, it's something I saw on Twitter recently from a, a fellow hurricane researcher and um, they were looking at some of the historical records of hurricane activity affecting Florida and noticed that in the decade from 1940 to 1950, there were more hurricanes and major hurricane impacts in Southeast Florida than in the entire 70 years since then, huh. um, which I thought was really interesting. And basically, I think, I mean, in some regards, Southeast Florida, you know, in the Miami area, they've they've had some close calls in recent years, but they've been lucky that they haven't really been been hit, and they could be, could be hit much worse, and have been hit with hur hurricanes with much more frequency in the past. Um, of course, the difference is, you know, in the '40s and '50s, there weren't nearly as many people living mm. in that part of Florida um, as they are today. And so, if you kind of took that same decade of activity and put it today, you know, that would be you'd have some really big problems. <laughs> All right, AD Finale wants to know, what is the most common misconception about atmospheric sciences? Um, I think that it's that forecasting is just kind of guesswork is probably the biggest misconception that, you know, we're just out there guessing on what the weather's going to be or kind of just looking at the clouds and being like, "Oh, yes, it's going to do this or that or the other thing." It's it's really it's it's a serious science. Um, it's it's physics, it's math and um, you know, weather forecasters you know study a lot of these detailed you know a lot of the detailed sort of mechanisms behind how these weather systems work a lot of math a lot of physics chemistry and all that sort of stuff and our predictions are based on you know it's not based on our weather forecasts are not based on statistics or um or again just our instincts they're based on these physical models of equations that are from basic principles of how our natural world works and, you know, they're not, you know, obviously our forecasts aren't perfect. You know, we're always trying to improve them. But, yeah, the biggest misconception is that it's just guesswork. It's it's not. It's really difficult um, and a very, you know, serious science, basically. And and the models are just getting progressively better and better. Yeah. Right? Computational power is increasing. For sure. I mean, so 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 you said there's there's a lot of intrinsic error bars like you can't model yeah. every molecule and so is there going to be a limit to how good we can model this like yeah is there... there definitely is i mean there definitely is an intrinsic limit to predictability and like we're never going to be able to predict you know exactly what the temperature and winds are going to be you know a month out or you know many many days out or something like that um but you know we can still do better than we can do now we can also do better at providing you know probabilistic information like okay maybe we can't predict 
exactly what the weather is going to be far into the future, but maybe we can give odds, you know, it's going to be likely to be warmer than this or colder than this or chance of this type of rain event or things like that. Um, and then, of course, there's also a lot of work we still need to do on thinking about how climate change affects different types of weather systems um, and what our expectations you know, are for that in the future. I mean, so so related to that point, uh, does it piss you off or does it capture something when someone says a butterfly flapping at wings starting a hurricane? <laughs> is that? I mean, that's a simplification of what this yeah, chaos theory is. It's, mm -hmm. But the, the, it's the right principle. The gist that, of it is there. Yeah, yeah these small, ah, small, small changes, small errors do ultimately affect, you know, the difference, especially, yeah, longer, in the longer range forecast, the differences in, in the different outcomes you can have. Mm -hmm. Timber 86 SS, first time chat, welcome to the stream. If you have questions for Dr. Allison Wing, throw them in chat right now. Um, atmospheric sci uh, sciences, tropical cyclones, Hurricanes, saving five-year-olds lives, I, she's ready to answer all of it. All fighting these weird things. <laughs> Ken, can you have chaos theorist Jeff Goldblum on the show? <laughs> I don't know how good Jeff Goldblum is at chaos theory, but I, I respect the sentiment. <laughs> if I could, I absolutely would. I should start emailing random, like, science celebrities. <laughs> see, do you want to play video games to talk science? And they'll so, say So, yeah, no. so how do you find your guests for the show? Is oh. it mostly, you know, fellow professors at FSU or other, like, who, who is the pool of people here? So, so I did in-person ask a scientist for a while, and it started out with, like, a list of five people I knew and then those people from chemistry that they knew. And it just slowly expanded because they knew people that knew people. And so I had that in-person list. And I basically looked at that list and said, okay, who's going to likely do this event? And mm -hmm. so the, the the gaming, I started out with 10 and then it just slowly expanded. I honestly don't remember who I got your name for. It might have been from Kathleen. I, I've reached out to Ka her a few times. Kathleen, Kathleen Hog Hogney. Hogney? Yeah, yeah. yeah, from the PR office. Yeah. And so she made a bunch of recommendations of people that would likely. And you absolutely destroyed that boss. Speedrun <laughs> strats. Well done. <laughs> um but yeah it's randomness and also i mean you have a big department if you know anyone so yeah. i've had angela knapp on before mm -hmm. um um elsner's done the in-person one i don't know if he'd be up for the video game version mm -hmm. of it but if, if you have suggestions i i'll yeah, ask definitely. you afterwards for emails but it is one of those like i probably emailed you a, an email that said hey i have a weird request <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you said yes because you've done a lot of outreach stuff so i think it was a good choice yeah by, it sounded fun yeah. <laughs> Laura Dern and Sam Neill, yes. Dinosaurs. I tried to get, um, uh, uh the paleontologist in my, um, Greg. What is his last name? I don't know. Greg Erickson. He, he's the guy that does, like, T-Rex and takes alligator jaws and models, like, force vectors and stuff like that. But he does not play video games. Uh -huh. But we are, um, so I passed off the in-person Ask a Scientist Gaming. We haven't done that in two years, but David Collins from Physics is going to do it again. So if you're interested in uh, in-person, we basically go to Railroad Square Park, set up a table with a sign that says Ask a Scientist, drink alcohol, and just talk to anyone that comes by. I think I saw that at, like, one of the first, like, first Fridays I went to when I first moved to Tallahassee. Yeah. Um, we like, I think I saw lunatics? I think I saw Jim Elsner there. Yeah. yeah the with asking a scientist is he um, still chair he well he's chaired the geography department oh which i is see a you different guys department okay. from us yeah i see different college even i know him <sighs> <laughs> invite timber 86 ss and I will take any scientist guest. In fact, uh, we, we've talked about expanding. It'd be fun to have like music theory or like art history yeah. or just anyone. Because I learn the most from like you. I don't know your discipline at all, which is kind of fun. So it's a bit selfish for me. Speaking of scientists, homegirl, homegirl wants to know Bill Nye versus Neil deGrasse Tyson. Who do you like better? Um, I wouldn't, you don't even have to frame this as better. Who, who's the I mean, science populist? I, I mean, I need to always go with Bill Nye, you know, pick my childhood. Well, I did definitely watch Bill Nye, the science guy a lot in childhood, but he, but he's also, you know, we're both Cornell alumni. So gotta go with my <laughs> fellow Cornellian. That, that's the, the affiliation. Yeah. 
I went to Cornell for undergrad and so did he. So he visited FSU. Um, he was here for the, the geo set. I don't know if you knew that Harry Croto's pet, um, no. uh, recording studio for science education. And so Bill Nye here was for the opening of it, but everyone I talked to was like, he was a bit of a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I've, I've, I've heard that. I didn't, I didn't, I've never met him. Um, no. but yeah, I, I've, I've heard that, but I don't know. He's got a cool bow tie. <laughs> no, we're not going to judge you for this, but, <laughs> but all time science populists. Do you have any strong opinions on Carl Sagan's or? Oh, Carl Sagan. I mean, Carl Sagan, he's a great, right? He was also so eloquent with how he discussed science. And just know, so public. chill. Just yeah. Like his delivery is. And he also had a Cornell connection. He was a professor at Cornell. <laughs> Walked past his, his old house frequently when I was a, a student. That's fun. So. so you can't stop those guys. The weird thing about this guy, like Mario 2, it just threw all those traditional Mario characters out the window. <laughs> they did whatever the hell they wanted. <laughs> I guess there's still some Koopas, but... Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I killed them, but then I fell off the ledge. All right, it's 10 o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ask a Scientist Gaming, mediocre gameplay expert level science. Um, if you're just joining us, you missed out on Allison beating Rainbow Road and winning the Star Cup on, on Mario Kart 64, but now she's off to Super Mario Land and playing with infinite lives, but nonetheless, this is a really hard game. But while doing that, Allison is happy to answer any questions you have on tropical storms, uh, extreme climate, uh, climate change, weather patterns, whatever you guys want to ask, throw them in chat and we will do our best to answer those questions. A mix of everything in between. That's one of the things I really like about the stream is the questions just, it sparks yeah. discussion that you wouldn't normally Necessarily, have. Yeah, come up with on your own. Yep. So that's really fun. All right, 10 o'clock. We have three more predictions left. We should probably do one of these. Which one do you want? Um, that. Do how many, which one has more tropical cyclones per year? Uh, one yeah, right that here. one there. All right, we're going to do another prediction. Anyone that's not following us, click the follow button, get your 300 standard internet units, and gamble all of them on this question because you are going to know the answer. Um, we're going to throw a, a yeah, This one is the one that you, you actually could know the answer. It's not like a random, you know. Yeah, yeah. this isn't How uh... old was I when something <laughs> help happened? <laughs> oh, you can crush those guys. All right. Yeah, those ones. I don't think. Can you crush those? Yeah, oh, those too. I think no. it's oh, everyone but, but I the can't bosses, fly, apparently. apparently. <laughs> All right, so we're going to throw a question up there right now. This is tropical cyclones related question. Click the follow button, bet your points. More tropical cyclones per year. Is it the North Pacific or the North Atlantic? Uh, note that on Ask a Scientist Gaming, you are on Ask a Scientist Gaming honor code, which means you can't Google the answer. You have to use your own knowledge set to decide which the, uh, the answers this is. Um, but yeah, throw your guesses or you know the answer click it right now is it north atlantic or north pacific or guess randomly these points don't matter so just have fun with them although ad finale is on a streak four for four so so oh gotta keep it up that's it's either very very lucky or knows some of the questions at least oh two of the questions there's no way that person could have possibly know lucky but, like yeah. i said better to be lucky than good yeah <sighs> I love like the music when they die. Da, 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 da. It's appropriate. <laughs> and it's it's embedded in your brain yeah. forever. I know if you ever played Sonic the Hedgehog, are you familiar with no. the Sega game? There's there's a, the sound when you're underwater and you don't have air. That is forever embedded in my brain. It's a non trivial jump. Oh. Okay, at least I didn't have to completely start over. Yeah, you got a checkpoint. <laughs> so those of you younger members of the audience, Game Boy was the first really popular handheld cartridge-based gaming system, at least in the United States. But it also didn't have a backlit screen. <laughs> so it was like much more like your, I don't know, the, the black and white reading books that we have now. It, it didn't have a light behind it, so you needed your own light source. It means if you're playing this at night, you like 
like driving. I don't know if you remember that being mm -hmm. in a car and it was like flashing lights was the only way you could play. The Easter Island heads was an interesting choice for Mario. Level. Yeah. <laughs> Quit killing the California raisins. <laughs> oh man. Anybody remember Virtual Boy? I actually have a Virtual Boy simulator on this computer. I have an emulator that can run Virtual Boy games. Are you familiar with this system? No, it was, I do not it know. It was like Boy. table mounted and it was like 3D glasses. You could like 3D image, but it was only red and black. It was terrible. Like people were getting <laughs> motion sickness. It was it was Nintendo's first gaming system bomb. Wow. But yes, I, re I never played Virtual Boy when it came out. Yeah, no, I never had that. Yeah, I used to, like, I played on my dad's Game Boy, and then I eventually got my own Game Boy Advance, and then played on Friends, Super right. Nintendo, and N64. All right, before we decide the outcome. So what's okay. interesting is is this number right here is based on the dollar amounts and okay. not the persons. Uh, so this is pretty even on persons, but people that said North Atlantic were more confident. Wow. So what is the answer? So which one has more tropical cyclones per year? By far the North Pacific. We must have a North Atlantic audience here in, in, <laughs> in this bias towards our local area. I don't know, but they got a, a four to one payout. But the, in the terms North. of the numbers, yeah, but the confidence was poorly placed. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is something that I like to remind people of. I mean, I, mean, I, I guess people could, on this stream could be from around the world, but probably most are probably from north america and obviously we're affected by hurricanes here and from the atlantic ocean but the atlantic ocean is actually only about 10 percent of the global tropical cyclone activity and the western north pacific is by far the the basin that has the most number of tropical cyclones they have you know you know 30 on average per year versus around 15 in the north atlantic and the other thing is in the in the western north pacific they actually they can have i mean they're most common again in this in the summer months but they can and do have hurricanes year round or typhoons year round there um, because the environmental conditions are much more favorable for for hurricanes and typhoons in that region so it's a, a lesson i guess to kind of think globally and not just be biased by our you know what our personal experience is it's generally hard to do. Yeah. I, I feel for him. All right. Um, do you want to keep playing this? Do you want to go golf, Tetris? So we're going to play NARC at about 1030. Let's do some Tetris. Tetris. Tetris for Game Boy? Yeah. All right. I should probably change our title from Mario Kart because we are no longer, no longer playing Mario that. Kart. Yeah. We want Mario Kart. <laughs> that was an earned victory. Yeah. All right. Tetris is a subcategory on Twitch. So let's go that. Playing Tetris on You're Tetris. Right. All right. Are you ready for this? No, but I'm going for it. <laughs> Had enough cider. It's okay. We're, we're going to be good. I love, like, hearing the music from these games again. It's, like, instantly recognizable. And... I think like I don't I don't know aren't there like sometimes like orchestras that will like play like <laughs> yes. concerts with Nintendo music? Yep. I mean I, I heard a, a factoid once it was from a Twitch streamer so take it with a grain of salt but the most recognizable characters in the world are not like Mickey Mouse or things you might expect it's it's like Mario. Wow. Nintendo it is a global phenomenon it was everywhere. <laughs> the pause screen of Battletoads, yes. I don't know if you ever played Battletoads, but that was a, no. a pretty spectacular beat. But what they did with, like, 8 bits is amazing. Yeah. I really respect. That's why I need a music theory person on to explain why this is so memorable. Yeah. It, it embedded in our culture and just it impacted everyone. All right. Any questions you have for Allison? She's playing Tetris. This one's... Maybe mentally more involved than the other ones. I don't, I don't know how you're feeling about <laughs> science questions during this, but if you guys have questions, put them in chat right now. We're happy to answer them. Tropical cyclones, storm formation. Um, yeah, anything we're, we're happy to discuss. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask you the big question. Unlimited budget and no moral qualms. What would you do? 
Yeah, that's a good question. That's a tricky one. Um, I mean, there's all there's been you know various attempts, both you know from serious researchers as well as non-serious people, to you know come up with ways of killing hurricanes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of that extreme version of weather modification. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been some suggestions that we should nuke them. <laughs> Um, <laughs> suggestions from the president of the United States at the time. Yes. Um, <laughs> but there's also been the serious line. research done to like, you know, coat the ocean in like oil, basically to prevent the, you know, flux of, the, of energy from the atmosphere. So I think like I would probably actually explore some of those ideas. Yeah. Um, I mean, you definitely need to have normal moral qualms because I mean, one of the issues with all the, any of this weather modification stuff is like, let's say, first of all, against all odds that you're, successful at killing that hurricane maybe it just means that you're like moving it to someplace else and yeah. someone else is getting hit i mean that energy is going somewhere right, right. It has to. so that's why like the morality of it i think you'd have to take that out of the equation first um and but for any of this to actually work the other kind of uh, i'm done you have to do it at such a large scale to actually affect something the size of a hurricane. So that's why I think you really would need unlimited resources to actually be successful at stopping a hurricane. So would nuking a hurricane? I mean, no. it would do something, right? It would, <laughs> it would do, it would, then you'd have a radioactive hurricane. <laughs> that's better, right? Yeah, uh, then, then Sharknado happens. We yeah. Get it. <laughs> no, but there are some ideas about, I mean, the idea about like, like coating the surface with oil to prevent like the evaporation like that, plausibly would work except again then you're like killing like sea life in the ocean including the oceans yeah. there have been some other strategies some other ideas about um kind of sending out a fleet of ships that like have some sort of rotors that will like stir up cold water from below the ocean oh, surface that's interesting um and that would work again but you'd have to do it on such a scale yeah. it, it, the the scale is i think the one of the big problems with with this um and that because again hurricanes get their energy from you know the warm ocean so if you remove that source of fuel um you're not gonna be able to power a strong huh. strong but you can strong control power. the energy release that is an intriguing idea yeah <laughs> three words giant ice cubes <laughs> thank you Reese's pieces unlimited budget <laughs> it worked in futurama right that's how they prevented global warming oh i don't know that that one <laughs> it's, it's how they proposed to at least a little bit okay <laughs> I mean that's that's pretty fun the controlled release of energy. Yeah. So I uh, so I guess I have a follow up question Wait, for how you. How do I? How do I? I don't want another letter. I have no idea. Oh, do you go by Allie? Have I been? No, I go by Allison. Also, okay. but I don't think there were enough characters anyway, and I, then I was also just struggling with how to do it. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, I typically go by Allison professionally. But yeah. I also go by Allie. Yeah, my my publishing name is Kenneth. But yeah. I go by Ken everywhere else, which is sometimes a problem at conferences, actually. Yeah. But anyway, one of my questions, so we do dimensional analysis. I don't know if you remember back to your general chemistry days, mm -hmm. if you took general chemistry, but like oh, yeah. converting moles to grams and, and like. Yeah. The, the, oh, we the, do dimensional analysis, too. So so one of the questions I want to do, and I'm curious because I'm a, I'm a light guy, is that a lot of the energy that's in our atmosphere and in our ocean is photon based, right? Light from the sun that mm -hmm. actually heats things up. So if we were to ignore geothermal energy, which is heat from the core of the earth, which is probably a non-trivial contributor, how many photons does it take to cause a hurricane? Like in terms of the amount of energy, because photons, I mean, people, like you get sunburn from UV photons. I have no idea even what the right like order of magnitude is yeah, for like a, numbers of photons. I mean, how much energy is in a hurricane? A and lot. You can back it up from there. Um, a lot of energy. Many nuclear bombs worth of energy. Yeah. So if if you have that number, I could do the math on different color photons and how many would be required. But I'm just I'm curious because it is. That's a lot of the energy that happens in our atmosphere. A lot of the motion is sun-based, right? Yeah. Um. All right. Let me think. Well, in <laughs> no, terms you don't of, have to answer. Let's this. see. In terms of kinetic energy, I mean, let's say the typical wind speeds. Let's say a hundred. Uh, no. Well, yeah, we can go with like the most intense possible hurricane, a hundred meters per second. Say that's like strongest hurricane ever. Um. But you wouldn't have winds that strong spread over the whole area. But. 
Anyway, take that, square it. So 10 to the four, multiply by the mass. I don't know, you're talking like... Have you given the final in your class yet? If not... <laughs> Thousands of tools of energy. This sounds like a like PhD preliminary exam question. <laughs> Have me as your external member, yeah. <laughs> and I want this answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> That'd be cruel to do on a student. Yes, I don't well, know. No, it I can't be, come up with a number. Here, here's why it wouldn't be cruel: is that if they even tried to go through the logic that you did, <laughs> right? They yeah, have succeeded. Yeah, right? it, which is exactly what you want out of a PhD exam. Mm -hmm. It's not the answer's not important. It's your thought process for how you approach the problem. Yeah. All right, homegirl, homegirl wants to know, who should be more scared, West Coast with San Andreas Faults or East Coast with rising sea levels? Oh, I would say the West Coast. I mean, we can do something about the rising sea levels, right? Like we can, you know, we can stop global warming if we just have the willpower to change our behavior on a societal level, um, at least to some extent. You know, some of it's already already baked in there. So the sea levels have already risen. Um, and we also can predict it, right? We're gonna know, we know how much sea level is rising, mm -hmm. but um, I don't, earthquakes to me are far more terrifying than any sort of weather phenomena because there's, I mean, we know which places are at risk quite mm -hmm. precisely, but we have very little ability to predict, you know, when something is gonna happen and, you know, few precautions you can make, right? And so rising sea level is like, right, we can, build seawalls or retreat from the coast or build our houses on stilts and, or, you know, evacuate ahead of a major storm. But I don't know what we can do with the San Andreas fault. I mean, seismologists are getting better at predicting, right? To some degree. Yeah, but I think it's still on the like, yeah, like minutes time See, scale. I need to have on a, somebody in your department knows this answer. Like what, what? Yeah. No moral qualms, nuclear bomb in the San Andreas Fault. You can dissipate some energy. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. what would, how would you control that if you had unlimited resources? Yeah. I don't, <laughs> again, I'm not really sure what, it would just change where the. Yeah, no, that's true. Where the yeah, fault was most kind of vulnerable. <laughs> Scuzzbot 10 has redeemed Take a Drink. Okay. Cheers, Allison. Thank Cheers. you for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. Hopefully you have a drink in hand. Cheers. Finals week at FSU. Indeed. Might as well celebrate. Is your class done? Yeah, I'm teaching a graduate class this semester, and we did not have a final exam. The students had final presentations last week. So That's fun. I still have to do the grades, but... So I'm, I'm going to give fun. you away my favorite, or give you my favorite, either Gen Chem uh, bonus question or graduate school homework assignment. It is... Come take some topic from the class we've taught so far and make a science museum e explaining it to five-year-olds. Nice, I like yeah. that. No, it's, it's a lot of fun because some get really, really creative and they they convey it and they understand it well enough to convey it to a five-year-old. In but, my um, extreme weather graduate class, the final paper I had them do was to like pretend they were writing like a newspaper article or blog post or something like that about, you know, some extreme weather event real or imagined, you know, that has occurred. And so to kind of try to write about it and how it would connect to climate change, you know, for a general audience, which is tricky to do to mm -hmm. kind of speak in plain language. Um, so it was, and I encourage them to be creative about it. So some of them like invented these, you know, nightmare scenarios about you know future possible extreme events that could happen oh no <laughs> scuzzbot 10 do they have to explain it to actual five-year-olds to pass the class no, <laughs> <laughs> no. They, they have to send me a powerpoint or some written document and i kind of judge it subjectively um but note that i've been to a lot of science museums so i have a rough idea of what's expected uh, fun factoid, there, there's a number of kids' science museums that if you don't have kids, they're skeptical about letting you in, and you have to actually <laughs> give an ID at the front desk. <laughs> Guess how I know that? <laughs> Before I had kids, we would have that issue. So some, like, museums have these, like, grown-ups nights at the yeah. museum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, when I was in grad school, we went to, like, grown-ups night at the Boston Children's Museum, and, yep. like, 
some of those museums are awesome. No, like they're, they're really fun and they have really cool exhibits. Yeah. And you don't appreciate them until you're an adult. Yeah. Like as a scientist now, I'm like, that is amazing how they conveyed a prism or they they showed some behavior, refraction or reflection or something in a very cool, engaging way. That's why I really like that exhibit. And some students really love it, and other students absolutely hate the assignment. And do they have to explain it to actual five-year-olds? Turns out now I have an actual five-year-old, so I could actually do that assignment with my own child labor. <laughs> Does anyone remember in the 90s when, when they said California would become an island by 2020 due to the <laughs> San Andreas Fault? I guess that didn't happen. I don't, I don't remember how, <laughs> how reality-based those predictions yeah. were. Yeah. <laughs> And maybe it's one of those things like wait, was at risk of becoming that if i mean that's the thing with like those faults like i mean any day could be the quote unquote big one right yep no so i went to grad school in los angeles i was at university of southern california okay it, it was on my mind because the exact reason you said you can't predict it it's under the ground it's gonna get you um but thankfully the big one didn't happen because we're overdue apparently for a, a big west coast earthquake uh -oh. All right, we're at 1020, about 10 minutes left. Do you want to play golf? You want to try golf let's, before let's closing? Let's do golf for Just a few minutes. Nostalgia yeah. purposes, yeah. do some golf. We should throw up one more prediction. Which one of those two do you want? Um, Let's do the model simulation one. All right, back to a simulation question. Um, standard internet units. If you're not following us, click the follow button. It's time to bet your points. Also follow us just because that actually helps our visibility. The more follow numbers we have, the more likely we are to be viewed. We are trying to reach as many people as possible with our terrible video gaming, but expert level science. So click the follow button now. It is time to do a prediction. This one, we're going to do it based on science. We could have done a <laughs> Make sure to do a question that AD Finale will get wrong. If you get every question right, you have won the night. Congratulations. All right. So Allison does simulations of hurricanes. How long for the typical simulation? Less than one week or greater than one week? Like this how is long real time. real time does it take to run the simulation? So can you explain what that means? So, yes, in the fair way. Um, right. So we talked before how I use, you know, order 100 processors to run the simulation so each of those computers is working to simulate solve these equations on this grid and it takes time for that to do so again a typical simulation i might do might be simulating 100 days within the model how long on the clock on your wall does it take those 100 computers working together to complete that simulation is that what's the typical length of the simulation 100 Lots days 100 days yeah and that's enough to model most, most hurricanes? So that's it. That's what I'm doing kind of equilibrium simulations where mm -hmm. I kind of want to just let the atmosphere get into a state of equilibrium, let a bunch of hurricanes form, reach some sort of steady state um, and see what's happening. If I'm kind of simulating a one, one hurricane and it's just individual development process, that would be like a 10 day simulation. Um, but you would probably have to do it at higher resolution. I and see. so it, there's you're running it for shorter but using you know more grid points basically okay so how much real time does it take to do one of these tropical model simulations is the answer less than one week or greater than one week less than seven days greater than seven days <laughs> cuddle puppy are computers unionized or independent contractors <laughs> <laughs> cheers cuddle puppy thank you as always <laughs> uh, i like it oh too far don't go in the water. Oh. Are they parallelized? Yeah. Yeah, they're parallelized. <laughs> what is the time step? Reese's Pieces, you have run out of time. All right, Allison, what is the answer? It's a, typically for the simulations I'm doing less than a week, about three days, three and a half days. So it's sort of, again, feasible to run many of these simulations because they're taking days of real time to finish rather than, you know, weeks or months or something like that. So it's like a hundred processors doing a hundred day simulation. Yeah. 
Oh, generating much, two much. terabytes of data and doing so in about three and a half days. I went from one water hazard to another. Yeah, <laughs> taking, so the core hours is like 10 to 15 core hours or processor hours, 10 to 15,000 core hours or processor hours. And so is there any excitement in your field about quantum computing and problems that can solve or problems that can be calculated that way that not normal processing works? Um. I mean, there's definitely a lot of excitement about, in general, you know, increased abilities of supercomputers and, you know, what what kind of problems, yeah, again, that we don't have the current capacity to. Right now, there's a lot of, actually, attention on GPUs, using mm -hmm. GPUs for computing rather than CPUs. Yeah. And the new version of the supercomputer that I use that's going to be um, launched next year, they're going to have a much sort of higher number of GPUs available for processing as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, improvements in computational capacity are one of the things that have enabled us to kind of make, um, you know, the process, you know, make the progress that we've been able to in, you know, weather forecasting and improvement in understanding of these things. And, you know, now people are doing, you know, global cloud resolving simulations. Um, yes. Nice. Um, Things that just were not possible previously. Yeah, I guess the GPUs that's that's become popular in like computational chemistry as well. Apparently, it's really good at linear algebra, hmm. and that's what a lot of yeah a lot of the matrix math relies on. That yeah. And so you're doing a lot of force and vector calculations, which presumably benefit from that type of yeah. I mean, we're just, I mean, the main thing we're doing is just numerically integrating partial differential equations. Mm. Um, so uh, most of our models are written in Fortran. Oh, wow. Um, we live in the past. Oh. But if you're just like doing a lot of just number crunching, yeah. Fortran is very fast at doing so. Um, wow. So you know how to program in Fortran? I. I know how to read Fortran and yeah. how to edit existing Fortran code. I did take Fortran, but um, well, not enough. But yeah, I would not be able to like just from scratch write you up some Fortran. No. <laughs> There's nothing to be ashamed of in that. That is yeah. uh, not an ancient language, but it's definitely it's, not the language of yeah. choice at this point. Yeah. Like early early computational chemistry relied on Fortran a lot, but I think they've gone away from that. Oh. Oh no. Yeah, for analysis we usually mostly use Python and MATLAB. I see. But the actual yeah, models are Fortran. <laughs> That's respectable. Only old heads like programming in Fortran. <laughs> I, yeah, I won't make judgments on that, but I've had quite a few theory people on. Uh, their favorite programming language is a common question, so I'll ask that. What's your favorite programming language? I mean, the one I'm most familiar with and comfortable with is definitely MATLAB. It's not necessarily the most efficient or the best, um, but that's the one I learned most, you know, learned in school and primarily have been using. There's definitely a big switch in the, you know, atmospheric science, meteorology, you know, in general earth science community to switch to Python um, as the kind of primary programming tool. Um, and I know a lot of people that are very passionate about Python and why it's so much better. I <laughs> don't. I mean, I guess it's it's good that it's open source. You know, MATLAB is very expensive, but to me, I find that things are way harder in Python than they are in MATLAB. Like, what takes me one line of code in MATLAB takes like seventeen lines of code in Python. And maybe that's just because I don't know how to do it properly in Python. But it's, uh... I mean, so your students that come in, most of them probably don't know programming at all. Um, yeah, initially. How, um, how do you deal with that? Is there a programming class or that's so our, exercises? So our undergraduates, they take Python. Um, okay. They use it in a couple of classes, and then we specifically do have a class on meteorological computations, which teaches them Python. Um, and um, graduate students coming in usually have some sort of programming experience, um, okay. whether it's Python or MATLAB or something else. I see. That's just intrinsic to your discipline. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, yeah, you, 
you can't do any research at all without some sort of programming language. Um, there's a few others that people use. Some people used to use NCL. Um, some people use, um, some people do use R for stats stuff. Some people use grads, which is not really even a real language. Some people use, um, what's the one, there's one that's used a lot for like satellite data. I forget what it's called. I can't tell you. But, um, yeah. Historically, MATLAB has been the most common, and now Python has overtaken it. Scuzzbot Woda says, MATLAB is the worst. It indexes from one. Well, I, how I do you start how do you start counting when you count? Do you do zero, <laughs> one, zero, one, two, one. three, four, five? <laughs> no, you go one, two, three, four, five. So But the on I switch of a that. computer goes from zero to one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know that MATLAB indexes from one. It does. That's interesting. <laughs> from zero. I start from zero. You have offended chat. <laughs> <laughs> Puddle Puppy, classic troll. I start counting from 69 and skip to 420. <laughs> Just no. <laughs> All right. We are approaching the 1030 mark. Are you ready for some narc? That, let me let me finish this hole. Yep. And then we can go for it. In the it. rough, it tells you where you are. It does. It's very explicit. Zero indexing is so much better for loops. If you say so. <laughs> Start a, starting a fight on programming languages. People are very pat. Have you ever seen the, the, oh, wow. the HBO it's show Silicon badly. Valley? No. Oh, man. There's, there's a great scene where this... Uh, I don't know if you're ever going to watch it, but there's this debate between spaces and tabs in programming languages, and he literally breaks up with a girl because she doesn't do what he does because <laughs> he thinks it's nonsensical. But I think I think a lot of it is just like what you're familiar with, like whatever you learn first is what's going to make the most sense to you. And so I learned MATLAB first. I'm just jumping back and forth between the water hazards here. <laughs> I learned no MATLAB first. And so, you know, the one indexing. Um, um became intuitive to me so it's very difficult for me mentally and also loops you know in malab you can do lots of vectorized codes so you don't need to loop uh in fact scuzzbot just said but i suppose loops are bad in that lab <laughs> allison you are living up to mediocre gameplay right okay now. this is this is mediocre <laughs> golf play because i don't know what club is the appropriate choice for uh, these different distances the, the nine-year-old golf class didn't, not it coming didn't through not coming back to me uh, there we go i'm on the green only took 87 <laughs> attempts uh so is your dad gonna watch this youtube video he might he was good at game boy golf and actual golf as well i'm better at mini golf than yeah. actual golf i respect that just do a driver for everything <laughs> yeah yeah all right there we go Great national nightmare is over we, we did it all right so we are on to narc are you ready for this i don't know <laughs> so this you need to instruct me on this game i, 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 I have will give never you even heard of it rough before. instructions we started this game as a joke and then it just kind of caught on and every guest has to play narc now so this is the war on drugs manifest as a video game from the 1980s so just say no no to drugs but license plate Basically, you're trying to beat the kingpin drug dealer, but you're going to do it by walking around and shooting drug dealers. <laughs> and so you have infinite lives, infinite rockets. Press start. Basically, it doesn't matter if you shoot anything. You just want to walk right until you find a door and then go in that door. Okay. And that's the extent of this game. Okay. <laughs> and so if you hold A, it's shoot. If you tap A, it's a rocket. Okay. And then if you hold B, it'll squat. And if you hold, if you tap B, it'll jump. Okay. So it's moderately clever in that they turned two buttons into four actions based on how much you hit. Am I supposed button. to shoot these people behind me? You can. They are a combination of drug dealers and flashers. So hold the A button down, you can unload bullets on everything. Nice. So Alice and I apologize ahead of time for this game. I on my stream, this was a game we had as a child. It was like a bargain bin game. And so I played it when I was the guest on stream, and then I just started making guests play it for some reason. 
All right. Reese's Pieces. The best thing about Python, if you don't know how to program something, that's okay, because someone else probably already made a package for that thing. And so Python does have a collection of that red card right there. But how do I... Oh, there we go. Yep. Just walk over things. I mean, that's both one of the good and bad things about Python. Like, there are a million packages out there, but that also means there's a million different ways to do something. And so it's... I find difficult to, like, you know, just Google, how do I do this in Python? You're like, whoa, well, you can do it this way in X-Ray and this way in Pandas, this way in NumPy. And I'm like, ah, I just want the one way. With a tropical geek agrees, it's overwhelming. Yeah. So that door right there. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> so if you hold both buttons, you can squat and shoot, and it'll okay. take care of the dogs. I'm dying a lot. Is is this everything you hoped it would be? <laughs> <laughs> Better or worse than golf? What? What? I oh no. Did I turn off the cheat codes? Oh. All right, we're putting on all the cheat codes. I need every ounce of help I can get. I, I apologize. I'm actually, I was I was playing this game, and I turn off the cheat codes when I play. All right, you're up. All right. Python has so many black boxes, you don't know what the fuck is going on. Yeah. I'm old school. Yeah. I mean, so, so that's interesting. So go ahead and press start. And, like, do you know... So your students are generating code. Do you mm -hmm. do you read through all that, or is it just oh, no. it, it, it exists, and when that student graduates, it's a black box the next one has to figure out? Well, um, sometimes, yes. I have, you know, sometimes, you know, used, reused my students' code mm -hmm. myself as well to kind of, you know, do similar calculations or go back and redo something they did with, you know, a different parameter or something like that. Um, I try to instill in them that they should comment their code well mm -hmm. and make it usable and understandable to other people. Um, and yeah, reproducible. It's always good. All right, so there's one other we wanted to touch on, and that is what is the Earth is flat or anti-vax equivalent of your field. <laughs> uh, we'll be right back when I put these canes. Definitely, definitely that that climate change isn't real. That that climate change is a hoax. The Earth is not warming. It's not because of us. That's the equivalent of anti-vaxxers. It's you know sometimes you know people I meet and then general public public they'll. Once I find out, once they find out that I study climate, they'll ask me like, oh, well, is this climate change a real thing? Do you believe in climate change? And my response is often, I mean, climate change, it's its not a belief system. It's not, it's not a religion that you believe in or don't. It's a fact. It's a scientific fact that the earth is warming because of, um, because of humans and how we have, you know, changed the composition of the atmosphere. Um, there's lots of, you know, remaining questions about exactly what impacts we'll have and the degree of warming, but that basic fact that the Earth is warming and it's us is unequivocal. Okay. Did I win? What happened there? I have no idea. I think that was a good thing. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, now we got two different types of people. I feel like I want to walk faster. I can't, nope. I you, can't, like, run like I did in You, you have Mario. to saunter on that exact pace. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, narc saunter. Now there's a the helicopter plastic. firing at me, too. Oh, yes. This game has everything you want for the war on drugs. Do you occasionally, like, run out of ammo? Like, I feel like sometimes I shoot and nothing happens. Um, it depends. There's a, there's a frame window when it rockets versus bullets so if you hold the button long enough it's bullets if it's short enough it's rockets and there's an in between where it won't fire anything mm -hmm. so yes yeah, so what, what you're feeling is probably real okay so up here you'll want bullets and you're going to shoot the so if you hold a 
something and blow up the, uh, whatever those things are, the chemical bins. Oh my god, the dog just, like, attacked me. Stop following me around, dog! Oh, I forgot I could jump. Oh, I know, I'm dead. I feel that when people say silly things, there's some, some truth behind it. So I ask you, what is that... What is it that fuels the nonsense of there is not climate change that the deniers allege? I mean, what they... Wait, I, sorry to steamroll you on this, but they, they, they really key up on the science doesn't know everything, therefore we know nothing. Yeah. And it's the absurdity of that that really... That's what gets them. And it's... Right. Yeah, and it's actually... I think scientists are... Tip, like, we as a tendency probably, like probably overemphasize the uncertainty like we are in terms of predictions typically conservative um in that you know we're not gonna kind of go too bold with our predictions we're gonna kind of say oh yes but this but that but the other thing we always caveat all of our results um and then but from a public communi communication standpoint that can sometimes yeah lead to the impression that there's more disagreement than there actually is on like the basic principle of, of, of what's happening and like I said before, there are, of course, you know, uncertainties in precisely exactly how much warming and where and all the other impacts it'll have mm -hmm. in many of the details, but that doesn't change the fact that... So check if you have a blue card. You might have one already. If not, so hold down, shoot when you walk near the black guys. One of them will drop a black card eventually. So hold it down rather than... Yep, just like that. One of them will eventually drop a blue card. <laughs> I apologize. So this is one of the random parts of the game that makes it really, really annoying. Especially if you're trying to beat it fast. <laughs> How dare you not suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> Absolutely right. Air is fake. It's invisible magic substance that science is made to get you free jobs. <laughs> <laughs> is there any truth behind that one, Tropical Geek? <laughs> Cuddle Puppy is our professional troll, and I always appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I mean, the climate change, it's such a... So when we did it in the in-person Ask a Scientist gaming, there there was one guy who was traveling through town. He was a truck driver, and he, he came up, and he was really engaged in talking to scientists. But he opened with, what's with all this global warming bullshit? And it was, <laughs> it was a very hostile opening, and I was yeah. expecting it to be confrontational, but the guy was, like, super chill after the oh, fact. Right. And he, like, he engaged, he thought about it, he he reflected on our discussion. That's like, yeah, unusual. It, was, it was the best scenario you could hope for. And and it, it really came down to, I think, what, what, what sparked something in his brain was this idea that, do you think 200 years of us burning stuff in engines has done nothing, nothing. to our atmosphere? Mm. And the answer is probably no. Yeah. So the question is, how big is that impact? I mean, this guy's a truck driver. He's yeah. seen it on a daily basis. He pumps a lot of crap into the air, and I think he knows that. So that really is the... Okay, if you tap jump, you can get in the car. Wait, how do I jump again? Oh, there we go. So stay at the bottom, and you're going to run into bombs, unfortunately. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> unless you memorize that path, it is pretty hard to actually do this. Okay. <laughs> so I apologize. That's okay. Now this turns into walking the No, I'm like, look at the, like, his, like, the way he walks, though. Like, <laughs> or she, I guess, because it's me. No, it's a he. I think his name is, uh, it's like Max Power or something ridiculous like that. <laughs> but, yeah. It's like cruising along there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The center of mass does not change at all. It's pretty <laughs> impressive, actually. Should model that with your force vectors. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we're at ten forty-two. I did not start the timer on this game. Uh -oh. Usually, I start how do I escape? Clock. What happens? Tap B, and you can jump. Oh yeah, Sorry. <laughs> I keep like, forgetting that I'm able to jump. It's like Napoleon Dynamite moonwalking. Yes, <laughs> it makes sense. He walks like that, given how tight his pants are. <laughs> Very true. All right, so you're you're a modeler. We're gonna do one of our other favorite questions. What is your favorite equation? Navier-Stokes equations, of course. Basically, Newton's second law as applied to fluid dynamics, rotating fluid dynamics specifically. They're fun equations. And so what do you use that for? Those okay. are, I mean, they're everything. They explain everything about, <laughs> about weather and climate 
Um, those are the equations that our weather forecast models solve, that our climate models solve. Those are the equations that we, we, we make when we're developing theory for, you know, different phenomena. We make approximate versions of those equations. Um, they're, you know, these massively nonlinear partial differential equations with no analytical solution to them. That's why we have to, if we want an analytical solution, have to make approximations and, you know, get rid of lots of terms. And that's why the, to forecast weather, we have to solve them numerically mm. using a model. And one of my favorite things I oh learned God, about I'm getting weather. murdered by this dog. So if you hold both buttons, you can squat and shoot. I know, but I can't like get far enough in front of him to shoot him. <laughs> What's your over under on solving Navi, Navi Snoke, Stokes before 3000 CE? Like deriving like an analytical solution to it? Yep. Not going to happen. <laughs> Skeptic. No, not going to happen. In the next thousand years, it won't happen. Nope. How stoked is Navier? <laughs> Thank you, Cuddle Puppy. And one of my favorite things I heard about, uh, like the weather and modeling and hurricanes and whatnot, is they they base the velocity on the redshift and blue shift of the reflected radar signal. Yeah, that's how you can derive um, observations of the the wind speed from radars. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean that was just that's such a fun, like whoever came up with that first is just yeah. brilliant, right? Yeah. That is. That is amazing. So those of you not familiar, I mean, you're you're going to send out a wave of light, and it's going to bounce off the surface and come back to you. And if that if that surface isn't moving, that wavelength will be actually exactly the same. But if that surface is moving towards you or away from you, it'll shift according to that velocity, basically. And you can use that shift to just to to figure out what the velocity is, and that's essentially how they get those yeah, those maps when they show the color Doppler and, radars. Yeah, it's just such the a Doppler cool shift. measurement. Yeah, and like having, you know, you know, that kind of again advance and those type of instrumentation, you know, allows you know for better forecasting and well as understanding. Okay, there we go. In the car. Oh, it immediately crashed. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the worst level in the game and there's no way to fix it. Actually, no, uh, so my, my brother's actually deconstructing this game, like reverse engineering the software. He's going to eventually figure out a code where the car doesn't blow up at all. Oh. That would make life a lot easier. If you go to the bottom, you can just walk. Oh, nice. That's way better. <laughs> just, like... just hold right. <laughs> and that's that's how we're going to beat this level. He's cruising along here. Yeah, you know, at some point when I have repeat guests, I'll have to do a different game. Yeah. That or you go home and commit to beating NARC as fast as you can. So next time you're on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go either way. Whoa, I think I took out both those dogs at once. <laughs> on the plus side, you can only have four of those guys on the screen at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I bet mean, Goodwill Hunting could solve Navia Stokes uh, during one of its janitor shifts. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, I need a mathematician on to ask how realistic Goodwill that hunting is. is. Apparently, they're real math problems, but they're not super hard, is, is what I've seen from YouTube oh, videos. Oh, in Goodwill, hel Goodwill hunting. Yep. They just look impressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be fair, anything high-level math looks impressive. Yeah. No matter what. All right, so we're closing out the night. It's 1046. Anyone just joining us, Ask a Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, Expert Level Science. Our guest today is Dr. Allison Wing, who's now playing NARC for the first time in her entire life and no doubt really enjoying the experience. <laughs> um, but we do have one more prediction we're going to throw up right now. Our final prediction of the night. Um, we'll see if AD Finale goes six for six. Seven, seven for, for seven. seven. Yeah. All right, so last prediction of the night. The question is, what is the total number of tropical cyclones globally each year? Is it less than 50 or greater than 50? How many things classified as tropical cyclones are there per year greater than 50 or less than 50? Again, if you're not following us, click the follow button both to support the channel as well as to 
Spend your internet points on questions like number of tropical cyclones globally per year, less than 50, greater than 50. Make your predictions now. Oh, I should have coached you through this. I don't <laughs> so, know where to go so or what go, to do. Go to the far right and go out that door and watch out for the clowns with knives. I know, but, <laughs> but it puts me back where okay, it was so before. so press up, but don't hold it. Oh. Okay, go further right. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Get back with the clouds. Back with the clouds. <laughs> Uh, and stop being killed. Uh, have you had enough cider for this to be fun? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, turns out this was actually an arcade game that you'd see in Pizza Huts. Okay, so like, wait, what am I doing? So press up, but don't press up too hard. No, like go no, through the door and just stop. So press up. Yep, just tap it. They are absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm yeah. up, I swear. Okay, go go to maybe the right a little bit. All right, there we go. Okay, now press right. You're gonna go through this door. You're gonna have different things, but you're gonna pick up a card. Clowns. Allison's arch nemesis is clowns with knives. <laughs> well, Apparently, we, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> knife wielding clowns are a major nuisance in the war on drugs. <laughs> it's Wait, true. I think I was here and I got a white. Oh, card. you did. Okay, so you're gonna go up, but don't go too far up. Uh, so just through the door enough, and then left. Oh, so I, I, oh it's a silver card. I, I thought was it was not white. paying attention at all because I was putting oh, the prediction in. Phew. So I, I thought I was like never going to skate that. I keep going in. There'd be clowns. I come back. I have to go to another door. There's more clowns. That's that's what your nightmare looks like <laughs> in, in arc. I apologize. I left you hanging on that. Sorry. All right. So yeah. we have an outcome. Uh, Allison, if you want to see the numbers, pretty confident in one direction. All right. All right. What's the answer? The answer is greater than 50. There is around 90 tropical cyclones globally every year. And you, I guess if you've been paying attention and heard a discussion about how many there were in the Atlantic and Pacific, you could probably infer that. But, That's true. So whoever um, hung around did their homework. Favorite people who've been here the whole time. <laughs> so 90. Not around 90. So, so if you had to do like a regional distribution of that number, mm -hmm. you know that off the top of your head? Like, yeah, it's like 10% in the Atlantic, like 30% in the Western North Pacific, and then divide it up everywhere else. So there's also hurricanes in the Northeast Pacific, South Pacific, Indian Ocean. There really are not... This is the one level you'll go left as you pick up marijuana plants. Some oh. of them are laced with explosives, so heads up. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this game is based on a true story. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't really have tropical cyclones in the South Atlantic or the Southeast Pacific. It is too cold in the Southeast Pacific. Oh, I need a card, it says. Do I have to, like, find that under one of the so plants? So you're going to have to shoot one of the Rambo-looking guys with bullets. So you have to wait for him to get a little closer to you. There, there he is. Go. Nice. Also a random card drop. Um, and then in the South Atlantic, there's too much... The atmospheric wind patterns are not right. Um, the other interesting thing about that through that door seven for seven is, on AD finale. Wow. The other interesting thing about that number ninety is that this is one of our biggest open questions in tropical meteorology. Is we don't really know exactly why that number is ninety. Why? Why do we have ninety tropical cycles per year? Why not nine hundred? Why not three hundred? Why not you know thirty? Um, it's we don't we don't know the answer to that question. You know, we could there you could have more. You could fit more, like just in terms of space, but um there's that number and it isn't changing especially that much and mm. we don't really know how it will change in the future. And yeah, that's if we knew what set that number, then maybe we'd be able to answer one of those first questions that were asked and about how the tropical cyclone frequency would change in the future if we but, had but theory. the intensity is definitely changing yeah the hurricanes are becoming that? yes we're confident hurricanes are becoming more intense especially the strongest storms those category four and five storms and that that will continue and that's we have agreement there we have observations that are showing um, especially in the atlantic that that's happening we expect from our basic physical theory um basically there's just more energy available to power the storms in a warmer climate um, and and the models that we use to study hurricanes, both again from a you know process kind of standpoint, as well as ones we use for projections, they agree. So when we have confidence about something, 
that it's going to happen a certain way with, with respect to climate change, that confidence often comes from us having multiple lines of evidence saying that. So we have both theory and models or models and observations or all three, ideally. Mm -hmm. And when, when there's only kind of one tool, the clowns again. <laughs> yeah, through that door. Um, when we only have one of those things, I mean, it might be right, but we don't have as much confidence in it. Mm -hmm. That's when the skeptics pick up on that slight doubt. Yeah. Tear it to shreds as if it's meaningful. The, the statement right. just a theory infuriates yeah. me. Right, like, yeah. You know, like a theory is thing. like, a th in <laughs> science, a theory means that like, we know how this thing works, basically. Like it's not a guess or a, we suppose a supposition or something. It's like a theory is a quite yeah. strong thing in science. All right, so you have all the keys for these doors. You just have to go up to them. All right, Reese Peason wants to know, is there a lower bound for the time between tropical cyclones for the same area? Like if you have one cyclone, the next one won't happen for at least X number of days. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, there probably is because there is sort of a minimum kind of separation distance between tropical cyclones, like they, are you know a certain size i mean their size varies but they do take up a certain amount of space and so they can't be on top of each other and so just based on that and like the typical speeds that they move at yeah usually you would, you would have at least a few days in between them in a given location um but yeah so it's a combination of i guess a maximum size or you know maximum packing minimum separation distance and typical speed at which they move i mean so this has to be an energy balance equation right like a hurricane sucks out a certain amount of energy and then yeah it's interesting like attempts to kind of use ideas like that to come up with say a theory for how many storm hurricanes we can have have mm. not really been successful actually <laughs> so hurricanes do i mean they they use energy they transport energy they contribute to you know global heat transport but if you don't have them, you know, the atmosphere picks up the slack in other ways. I see. Um, so those kind of global budgets have not been successful at explaining why we have the number of hurricanes that we do or the spacing that, that they have. I, I mean, do you ever just get frustrated at this problem? Because in <laughs> some ways it's intractable, right? I mean, it's... I, I don't know. I mean, it's... I guess it's... Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating in that we still don't understand it, but it's also motivating because we... I think we will be able to understand it one day. Mm. Um, and I think now, you know, we're actually in a good place to really get there with the, you know, modeling cap capacity that we have with, you know, new observations, um, advances in our conceptual understanding. Um, so you've, you've found an amazing glitch in that you can't have more than four things on the screen and you just do brought I, wait, the dogs with you. Wait, do I not have you. a gold card? No, you got to shoot a guy in a wheelchair now. <laughs> Oh, there he <laughs> so you is. They shoot him with rockets. Okay, fun. <laughs> so this one's where you tap the A button. There you go. <laughs> I apologize. You didn't know when you started the night you'd be shooting dogs and people in wheelchairs. <laughs> but here we are. So wait, wait, did I get him? You did. Yeah. So you got to get him two more times. Oh, come on. <laughs> I apologize. I didn't write the rules. <laughs> this is what Narc has delivered to us. But you got him once, which means it's just a matter of time. Yeah, so that's the major drug lord who's Mr. In Big in a wheelchair. Great. You're winning the war on drugs. All right. We got about, I don't know, 10 minutes left. Uh, Allison's off on the first phase of the last boss of this game. So if you guys have questions, you want to know something, you have burning things you want to understand about tropical cyclones or extreme weather, Allison is happy to answer them. Now is your chance to ask them. So... Um, throw your last questions in there. We are completely out of predictions, so it's up to you guys to, to come up with the dis discussion points at this point. Actually, that's not true. I do have one more for you. If you weren't doing what you're doing, I mean, obviously you love what you do, atmospheric sciences, but if you picked another discipline, I mean, this could be anything in the sciences. Yeah. This could be, I don't know, music theater. I don't know. <laughs> what does what Allison Wing's second career look like? Well, um... So I was asked a question earlier, what I want to go to outer space? And I mentioned that, yeah, one of my career goals as a fifth grader was to become an astronaut. We had to kind of make a prediction about, you know, yeah, what we what we wanted to be when we grew up. And I wanted to be the first female 
author, musician, artist, lawyer, astronaut, president. All of those <laughs> at the same time. Ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know that I actually would prefer to be one of those things I, over what I would do being be. president sounds horrible. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. when we're realistic about it, like and same thing with being a medical doctor. Like yeah. at Gen Chem, we have so many students that are like, I want to be a doctor. Like, do you really do you want to do customer service with a bunch of people with rash? How do I escape under like, this guy? Oh, so this guy you have to jump and shoot him in the hat, and I'll I'll let you play around with it for a while. I might <laughs> I'm just jumping. So we we'll probably have about ten, five minutes or so left. If, if anyone has suggestions on who we should raid, throw those in chat. Carl Sagan is on, but he's got such a huge following. I should email him. So there's a guy that plays Mario Maker on Twitch. and He has a huge following, but he's also a virologist. I think he's out of uh, University of Arizona, actually. But he, he plays. He could go full time doing video games, but he loves what he does as a virologist, which wow. is kind of a fun unique combination he'd but, arguably make more money on twitch if he did that full time i can't get <laughs> what, 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 next to him enough to actually shoot him so what i recommend is run away as far as you can I, so jump and press right and if you're at the top of the screen his tongues won't hit you <laughs> which is a sentence you didn't think i'd be uttering tonight but there we are <laughs> there you go it's the top of the screen and then turn back and jump and then you have to shoot a rocket <laughs> <laughs> I give up. All right. You can't do it. I'll, I'll, I'll get this hat off. <laughs> My fingers are sore. <laughs> it's, it's been a long night. Three hours are almost to so. Here's what you got to do jump and you got to hit him like right in the top of the hat. Oh, oh man. I'm washed up. There we go. All right. Now it's going to be punch him or shoot him in the face. With a oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Scuzzbot has redeemed. <laughs> I'm going to do one of the Black Widow. Blackberry ciders. All right. Cheers, Scuzzbat. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the questions. This is my sister in law, by the way. I nice. figured out which Scuzzbot is which. All right. So for this one, it's not rockets anymore, it's bullets. So I'd recommend running away and then turning back and shooting, and running shooting away, turning back and shooting. This is, I mean, as a, as a programmer, you'd appreciate how broken this fight is. <laughs> this. <laughs> This, sh Hopping. <laughs> this shooting, actually hitting his vertebrae, depends on when you press the shoot button and your X, Y coordinate oh on the screen. Oh my god. And certain times it hits and other times it doesn't. It's absolutely terrible. Okay. But you have to be below this line to okay. make some of the shoot the shots happen. So bullets hold the shoot button. Mm. And if you if you rage quit, no one will hold it against you. You're not the first and you won't be the last. Oh wait, I'm supposed to... Yep, hold. hold the A button. Yep. And you have infinite bullets, so you can just literally hold that and run around. <laughs> so you gave me a list to the answer of what you're gonna but it realistically, let's say you could go on sabbatical and in spend a year change. Just like lay on the beach and do nothing. Um I I don't know. Hold yeah, that one. Um I don't know, something totally like, yeah, different, more like music or art or like, I really like photography. Maybe I would mm -hmm. do some photography. I like, yeah. I mean, I, I played the piano and violin growing up. I was, you know, never especially good, but if I could like make myself good, then doing that would be nice. <laughs> um, yeah, something, yeah, totally other side of the brain, I think. Man, we had a. Uh, do you know Don Carr? She's in sociology. No. She recounted a story. She was like hardcore musician, like that. That was her thing, and I don't remember what actually. It was. It was like she played clarinet or something, like a w woodwind instrument of some kind. But sometime in undergrad, when she was doing performance major, she had a dental surgery that actually severed one of her nerves oh. and actually debilitated her ability to play music. Oh no! And for her, it was like a blessing. It, it brought her to the career she ultimately ended up doing. Oh, wow! Because music is. I mean, that's a brutal it's profession. Really like it's yeah. it's gig to gig. So yeah, it's. Uh, it was just, it was breathtaking to hear that because it was just like bad luck, but also, I don't know, destiny. Yeah. <laughs> it's running away from him. <laughs> yeah. So somewhere, yeah, just hold, sh 
hold the bullets. Ah! Holy crap. Scuzzbot Wotus, did you just see that shot series? That normally doesn't work out. So now you just need two more vertebrae. So you go down and shoot facing back the other way. Yeah, I know. I'm and just getting far enough away from You don't from even him. have to walk towards him. Just stand back. All right. Ah. I'll walk to the end. There's one more level after this. But don't worry. It's easy. <laughs> There's nothing in the level. All right. So I got one suggestion of who to raid. Carl Sagan. I, I think we can go that way. So, Allison, if you're not familiar, raiding in Twitch is basically bringing your viewers and yourself to another stream. Okay. And... Oh, I get really far away from Yeah, here. it's just kind of social interaction. Fun. Oh, wow, that was really fast. It was on the four vertebrae. So this is civil forfeiture of the level, where you're just stealing all the gold from the drug dealers. No due process in, in our... <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> you're, you're just, you know... Stealing from the bad guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious how much these gold bars would actually weigh, but dimensional analysis. <laughs> Do some math on NARC. All right. That is it. Nice. Congratulations, Allison. Uh, Not only did you beat Rainbow Road and Mario Kart, but also you won the war on drugs. Won the war on drugs. So My greatest achievement. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the pinnacle of Ask a Scientist Gaming is beating NARC. <laughs> so congratulations. I'll figure out what the actual time is because I keep tracking my guest time. Okay, nice. <laughs> but Go back to the recording. You know. All right. And you can put your initials in. There we do, go. Due processes for Democrats. How do I... <laughs> Uh, and oh, over to the okay, end got button. It. All right. I feel like that was like a little finger on the yeah. camera. That was funny. <laughs> it was like a thumb. Yeah. <laughs> they made it intentionally awkward. Nice. All right, Allison, uh, thank you for joining me on this very strange endeavor. I, I hope you had a good time. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, um, it was fun. Uh, it, it's always awesome. Um, don't you mean due process? Yes. Uh, but anyone, uh, thank you for joining us as always. Your questions are amazing. It really brings us down tracks and discussion points we really like talking about. So uh, again, thank you. You make this th this experience a lot of fun for all of us. And so Allison, any parting words for the audience? Um, yeah, I don't know. Thank you guys for, for all your questions. And um, yeah, make sure you follow the National Hurricane Center for your hurricane forecasts, not you know some other random person on the street. Absolutely, especially those of you that live in Florida and in the Tallahassee area. Turns out we have to worry about this on average zero times a year. But, <laughs> but those non-zero years, turns out it matters a lot. Yeah, so, and it only takes one, right? Exactly. Um, and so again, Allison, thank you for joining us. Um, join us again in two weeks. We'll have Chris Mills on, who's a computer scientist that does machine learning and AI and applies it to actual problems like the medical field or legal uh, problems, actually trying to, you know, use this as software package that someone can do something useful with. So join us again in two weeks. I think that's May 11th is the date behind that. But uh, again, it's been a pleasure. Um, stick around. We're going to do a raid, I think, of Carl Sagan. Um, but yeah, again, thank you guys as always. And until next time, thank you for joining.